Say good morning, everybody, to the second day of this uh, workshop, Digital Pinocchio. We continue the um, works of uh, the symposium. Uh, I um, uh, say uh, good morning to all of you and, uh, and also to the Institute and Professor Cucchio and Dr. Rondina. Buongiorno, uh, Massimo. Us. Buongiorno, buongiorno. <laughs> and uh, so um, it's, it's a pleasure to buongiorno. give the floor. <laughs> Buongiorno. It's a pleasure to give the floor again. Uh, to... It's a great to see you again. It was great yesterday. I missed the, the last talks in, um, of the, um, the half day yesterday, the last, because I had another meeting, but it was really exciting. Very, very nice. Great. Thank you. Thank you. No, I was, I was so, very pleased. I'm and very, very, happy. very glad to see you again. And so, uh, <laughs> uh, are you? Are you planning to, to, to be in the um, session, uh, so the, the, the party, the uh, next uh, Tuesday? Oh, unfortunately, I'll miss the party. Well, I'll try to be there online. But, uh, online, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, yeah, I won't be able to be because on the 27th of June, I will receive the second shot of my vaccination oh, in Turin. I'm so. receiving the, the second uh, shot this afternoon. Oh, okay, good luck. <laughs> what, what, uh, what vaccine you got, AstraZeneca? Uh, it's, it's not clear yet because uh, there is a lot of debate in Italy about uh, getting yeah. the second shot as AstraZeneca or, um, or uh, another Moderna. Kind of, uh, vaccination. Pfizer. You know, I like cocktails in general, so I, I, it would be good. Okay, in any case, a... uh, we will meet uh, electronically, uh, remotely, but in October we will be uh, in person, hopefully. Oh, absolutely. Like, I'll, I'll be there again okay. and very, very happy to meet the, the audience uh, in Paris. Great. Okay, so, so where uh, is Sir Jessica? So. Uh, thank you very much for your presence. I no, thank you, with, thank you, uh, Massimo. It was great. Really With great. Works. So uh, Francesca is here. Thank you. Good Thanks morning. a lot. I was I was very Hi, happy Francesca. with, uh, with the works of the of the symposium yesterday. Today we continue with a new lecture by Professor uh, Elsa Soro, who is a professor at the University of Turin, where she teaches semiotics of tourism. She also a postdoc researcher at um, ERC Project Facets. And she's a professor at Barcelona Open University. Uh, she has been studying and, and working as a professor in Barcelona for a number of years, where she's also part of an important network uh, a, a assessing cities uh, also through the um, um, methodology of semiotics, but she's going to probably talk more about her job and, and her research um, uh, herself in the lecture, which is entitled Plenty of Catfish, How to Steal Faces in the Sea of Online Identities. A professor Soro has a competence in tourism, but also in uh, the semiotics of leisure, including um, digital dating. And uh, I thank her particularly because, uh, as I said before, before meeting here, we were having a seminar in Shanghai from seven to nine. So I introduced her in Shanghai. Now I, I, um, I present her in Shanghai. I present her again here in, uh, in Paris. And uh, thank you for the effort. It won't be forgotten. And uh, the floor is yours, Professor Sol. Thanks, uh, Professor uh, Leone. Thanks, Massimo, for your uh, very generous presentation. I've been happy to fly from Shanghai to Paris in just <laughs> five minutes. So, uh, well, this, um, this technology allowed us to be uh, in many places at once, so that is also uh, an, an interesting, uh, an interesting thing. So uh, I will obviously uh, thanks the um, CY Institute for the kind invitation and Professor Kikyu and uh, Professor Francesca, sorry, what's the surname? Um, and I'm very. Um, of Dr. Course. Rondina, Rondina. Rondina. Okay, thanks, thanks, Massimo. And obviously, is a uh, needless to say, it's a pleasure to be uh, here um, with our our colleagues and member of the FACE group, and also external guests. So, I will uh, share my screen. Trying to um, do it quickly. Okay, I hope you can see uh, the screen. Yes, no problem. Yes, okay. Perfect. 
so well, the title of my presentation, and we will uh, see why of this, of this, this title is legit or no, is uh, in fact uh, plenty of catfish. <clears throat> how to steal faces in the uh, sea of online nude identity. Before getting to the point, I would just want to show you a, a very uh, quick uh, video, which is relevant for the topic. Okay, and then I will explain what it's about. Oh, sorry. Let's see if I can play the video. Um, apparently not. Maybe Just if you go it. toward the uh, bottom of the image, there's going to be a, a bar to select uh, the, the play option. Oh, yeah, okay. Found it. Thanks. Hi, I'm Julie Adenuga. And I'm Uber Butler, and we're the hosts of Catfish UK. I feel like 2021 is a great time for Catfish UK because catfishing is happening more than ever now. Yeah, the methods that people are using to catfish are more sophisticated than ever. Yes. I mean, because like everyone's now living online, they're meeting people online, they're doing every aspect of their lives online we need to step in to help them because yeah. there's a lot of lying going on. And I think when everybody first saw Catfish, yeah. that blew people's minds. Oh my goodness, this person's whole life, you know, like everybody was really confused. But now there's so many subtle ways. You don't even have mm. to create a whole complete fake profile yeah. to be a Catfish. Yeah. And I think in the UK, the amount of Catfish stories that I've heard, it's yeah. time that we spoke to some of those people. Totally. And we need to give Neve some time off. <laughs> yeah. That guy's been working hard for too long. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, catfishing has changed completely since that first series yeah. aired. Like now you can, you literally don't know if the person you're talking to in a video call is that person. Yeah. They can fake that. Yeah. They can fake anything. It's gotten way more sophisticated. Definitely. The biggest one for me is filters. Right. How they've become an everyday thing. You know, a celebrity sure. will go online to talk about donating money to a charity and they've got a filter on. Right. It's just like right. a natural right. thing to do now is to just change what your face looks like. Yeah. And that I've seen is the biggest complaint that people have is, you know, I went to meet this person and they just didn't look the way I thought they did. Right. And it's because you... Uh, okay, I think uh, that's enough. Well, behind uh, the, uh, well, the triability of... Uh, of the video, these uh, two guys make some uh, relevant uh, affirmation. Uh, affirmation that uh, all along our uh, research project phases, we have tried to kind of deconstruct. So some affirmation are, uh, well, um, you can fake everything. Uh, the people doesn't look like uh, uh, they can uh, fake the real face by, you know, in this way, naturalization, the idea of having a real face. Anyway, what is uh, relevant is also that uh, a mainstream uh, TV program uh, played by MTV um, tar that uh, targets uh, young adults um, is, uh, is devoted uh, ultimately to unmask the deception in virtual community. Just to give you some uh, little context, if necessary, uh, the uh, program um, of which we were just seeing this uh, little fragment is called Catfish UK and hosted by these two guys are very apparently very popular in TV and radio uh, culture in the UK. Uh, Julia Danuga was also the sister of famous rapper Skepta and Uba Butler. So, uh, so the uh, Catfish UK uh, follow the same format of the uh, original US version um, in, in which the presenter are meeting people across uh, the country uh, who think they have, been, they have met their soulmate online only to discover if they have been catfished. Uh, so the way that the program, the, the TV program characterized the online courtship uh, as a space for authenticity and at the same time as a space so vulnerable to uh, the fake. So starting from here, um, in the following, I will explore. Hi, I'm Julie oh, Adenuga. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the following, I will explore the catfishing phenomenology as pictured by entertainment uh, textuality, uh, textuality such as uh, uh, 
this uh, this TV format, and in general, uh, as pictured by the internet buzz, internet blogs, uh, service pages on Facebook, uh, which are uh, the main uh, sources of this uh, research and of this call, uh, as theft of uh, virtual images, and in particular, wheelchair faces, uh, the catfishing practices poses uh, a problem of the fluidi fluidity, uh, variability, and the migration of images in the transformation of the initial value and in dissemination of their agentivity in the collective actoriality of the internet. This is one of my main uh, point of interest. Uh, my main focus uh, thought uh, for this seminar will be the uh, stratification of levels of deception created by the eruption in the um, in the cold uh, in the so-called Roman scammer practice of uh, artificial intelligence generated faces faces that at least at the first reading they don't belong to nobody and thus are fake, catfish fake, and therefore authentic. What we will try to draw here is a reflection about how the new generation of catfishing complexifies further the attribution of an identity to a virtual face. So let's start uh, this itinerary from the beginning, which is the story of uh, the catfishing, uh, at least uh, in its supposed fundamental moment. So uh, before uh, becoming a um, before becoming a TV former, uh, Catfish um, was, uh, so the um, Catfish TV uh, program is a spin-off of uh, the Catfish um, American documentary uh, that was released in 2010 and directed by uh, Henry Jones and uh, Ari Schurman. Uh, the documentary involved a young man uh, being filmed by the brother um, as he built a romantic relationship with the young woman that he met on, uh, on a social network. So is it not working that the same documentary generated uh, uh, the release, that the same documentary generate, uh, generated an impressive uh, buzz in the internet about um, when it was uh, um, unveiled at the Sundance Film Festival, and the buzz was about the very vericity of the same documentary. There are those in the critics and the audience who believe that the whole film was an hoax performed by actors, uh, and uh, uh, they told that, uh, that they manipulated the, the truth. These are, you know, some um, press release. There is also uh, the documentary also raises a discussion about the genre to which it belongs to, uh, either a documentary or a mock uh, documentary. Uh, and uh, uh, in the uh, Sundance uh, release of the documentary, a comparison with uh, uh, the mock documentary um, devoted to Bansky, uh, Exit Through the Gift Shop, has been made by critics. Uh, the open credits uh, remark, and I'm go gonna show you very quickly. See her full on going out? I guess I don't know that much about her. I don't really want her getting hurt. I'm not getting hurt. So, what's the next move? I think we drive up to Megan's farm in Michigan. It, this is it. Just pull up. I want to drive into the driveway. Yeah. Are you crazy? What do you mean? Drive into the driveway. What do you mean? Don't drive. back into it. Why not? Because then we can't see what's in front of us. I'm all scared. Let's go. 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 Let's go.
So a documentary or no documentary, Catfish um, is uh, also um, described by the producer as a reality thriller. Um, so briefly, uh, this uh, first level of fake about uh, uh, whether it's a documentary or not, uh, whether the story is true or not. Uh, I just have to give you some uh, brief insight about the story that the documentary is about. Basically, this young photographer, Ned, that uh, uh, got in contact with uh, uh, some uh, prodigy artist kid uh, hand with their family and uh, of course with uh, a supposedly uh, very attractive uh, half sister of the uh, young kid. So after uh, many contact, uh, after the uh, online relation, uh, relationship um, uh, got on, uh, the uh, protagonist has been sent by uh, uh, these girls, uh, picture, uh, also covers of a song performed by her, but then uh, the protagonist discovered that uh, uh, they are taken from YouTube performances. And at the end, what happened that the, uh, the protagonist went to Michigan in order to find out if this girl was real or not. What he found out uh, ultimately is that uh, the person uh, to whom uh, he was in contact with was the mother of uh, the uh, supposedly attractive uh, girl who didn't exist. And the mother, in order to have uh, some friend due to a very uh, bad life, uh, what he did, he was uh, stealing a picture of face from uh, a variety of other uh, online uh, profile and having a kind of uh, uh, conversation and uh, friendship uh, relationship with uh, uh, with other user uh, who uh, she didn't uh, met uh, as a happy ending of the documentary of or the movie according to the, depending on the version um, in a sort of moralistic uh, parabola, Angela, the mother who stole uh, faces from a very attractive model of a random girl on, on Facebook, disactivated her 15 other profile and changed her Facebook profile to a picture of herself. And by so doing, exposing her virtual face has the only uh, index of her identity. So, uh, well, it's worth also worth mentioning. But I want uh, I want uh, mentioning because it will take a bit of time, and we are a bit. Uh, I want to uh, focus on other topics. It's worth mentioning that the documentary is credited with the coining of the term catfishing, that since then has been used uh, also in uh, in cybercrime and has been uh, very common now. Uh, so in the documentary, uh, the origin of the catfishing has been explained. Maybe we can talk about that during the discussion. Um, so afterwards, uh, oh sorry, every time, okay, every time I pass the slide, it's some uh, sound. Uh, okay, so um, afterwards, uh, after the movie in 2010, uh, the catfish and the catfishing found its legal stance in both civil and criminal cases as a, a cyber crime. Uh, recently, also academic literature, we have, uh, you have here two references that have studied the uh, phenomenon from a criminology point of view. So recently, academic literature uh, identified a usual, uh, academic literature and only, uh, identify a usual narrative path of the relationship between the catfish and his or her victim. So basically the scammer create fake profiles in various social media and dating uh, sites, in particular using attractives, that's, that's the way the uh, literature describe, picture of men or women, in order to increase, this is another assumption, to increase the likelihood of the victim to respond. The support catfish work normally, uh, he has a, a topical story, the catfish uh, works abroad uh, as no relative of family that uh, can help him he or her, and uh, this loneliness of the catfish is normally create 
a, a potential bonding uh, point with their target. Uh, normally, uh, the catfish also uh, uh, indicate a romantic interest and proof of love for their victim very relatively soon. Uh, and when the relationship has been established, uh, uh, there are very the literature track a range of way through which the scammer may defraud the victim. So they will normally, the scammers make arrangements to uh, meet the victim, at the, but never made, but, but never made it. And uh, sometime, at some point there are some accident or some tragedy uh, popping up the way uh, so to um, push the victim to send money or to lend money to uh, the catfish. Uh, what is, uh, so is, uh, I've defined it like a semiotics of passion because there are lots of uh, uh, pathetic uh, figure in the, uh, in the pattern of the catfish story. So according to the internet buzz, uh, you know, the, the dedicated pages and blogs uh, um, around scammer in uh, dating services, uh, so according to these uh, uh, sources, uh, the catfish can be easily recognized by his or her uh, face. Um, for instance, uh, there is a, a search, a service, that is a, a, a Facebook page devoted to catch the catfishes. So uh, according to supposedly uh, evidences from this uh, service, which is scale social catfishes, um, the uh, typical catfishes choose a photo for their fake profile by Googling terms such as intelligent man with glasses or white man in suit. Also, uh, the catfish wear the face of a model or a soldier. This is another typical, uh, according to the internet buzz, way of catfish uh, present themselves. Um, by demonstrating a certain um, widespread beliefs in physiognomic myths of a, a supposedly a trustworthy face. Um, so, for example, in this article, you can see a, a screenshot of uh, uh, it has been stated the existence of a face more likable to be catfish bait. So, such impersonation uh, is certainly one of the most important topics related to the practice of uh, catfishing for, uh, for semiotics. At the same time, the practice draws attention on the dissemination and exchange of images and their cross-platform cross, uh, uh, circulation, where in this cross-platform uh, uh, realm, Google, uh, of course, can be considered as the main source of face, operate a sort of opaque uh, mediation, uh, till the point that the original owner of the face uh, of a virtual image lose completely such ownership uh, and the same uh, intentionality of his or her face. Uh, one may argue that when an image is online, it can presumably be accessed and used by almost everyone regardless of the intent, thus detaching the image not just from the initial purpose but also from the initial identity. So, um, Already in 2006, uh, the air curator Marisa Olson invented uh, the founding Nasty Nets, an internet serving club whose members were art, uh, internet artists, offline artists, as any kind of creative uh, uh, people and uh, internet enthusiasts. We were invited uh, to post to the website material that we found online, many of which were then remixed or arranged into large composition of lists of images bearing commonality. So of course, uh, for us, the concept of uh, wandering of images uh, uh, resemble at the, the uh, already very early consideration by uh, Walter Benjamin, um, so this, this concept of wandering of images uh, is, uh, is turning even more uh, unpredictable. Um, 
with the uh, images generated by the artificial intelligence. And I'm trying to get to uh, the point. Um, recently, uh, artificial intelligence um, faces had a layer of uncertainty for also people in dating apps uh, and uh, engaging with uh, um, Roman uh, scammers. What is surprising is not just how the machine have learned, we, we know it very well, at least it's a subject of our research, uh, so it's not surprising how the machine have learned to generate faces, but how these faces are become more and more available on the internet, even for free. Here you can see uh, this website that's uh, called this person doesn't exist, that rely on generative adversarial uh, network to generate fake face. If the stolen face were uh, relatively easy to catch, you know, do you remember in that Catfish TV program, um, normally the procedure is just doing a, a reverse, a Google reverse image search to identify whether the face belong to the person who claimed to, to be that person or not. So this is uh, basically the tool that um, in 2021 TV program used for catching Catfish. Uh, but obviously, um, when uh, faces are generated by a uh, gun, this, uh, this, um, this practice is, uh, uh, is uh, even more, obviously more complicated. Nevertheless, there are also websites and blogs that uh, uh, learn, that teach how to uh, recognize fake uh, a uh, high generated image. Okay, so one of the uh, uh, ones of the main uh, tips that is uh, kind of services in kind of textuality give to user is like, for example, to uh, you can identify whether a uh, face is a, a fake if, for example, have stri if the straight air looks like paint. I have a picture that I have extracted from um, a blog. Well, this is about Messier, but anyway, if uh, in case of Messier, uh, you know, this is not very, um, the, the, the texture of the air uh, is not really, um, is not, you can really, you can't really identify it. Another topic is uh, the symmetry of uh, the face. And uh, what is said is like that uh, faces created by um, artificial intelligence are very uh, frequently cross height. Uh, so the principle of symmetry is not supposedly uh, respected. Also, uh, there is some problem with the teeth in the, in the fake phase, uh, in the artificial intelligence uh, intelligent phase, has the teeth are uh, misaligned or uh, strangely sighed. Um, then uh, also there is uh, differences uh, in the color around the edge of the face. So these uh, are uh, one of the tips in order to identify a, a AI generated uh, face. Um, so, um, like trying to uh, make him some uh, final remark in all this story. Uh, in new catfish, uh, the new catfish is arguably a common uh, testing ground for a researcher. And these characteristics uh, are just a way more to refer to, refer to how a face is a volatile uh, semiotic object, trying to escape even its own uh, falsification. The traditional catfish were accused by identity theft. But my point is, here is, uh, aren't, aren't they stolen also the uh, artificial intelligence generated uh, catfish one? In their uh, article, uh, Excavating Artificial Intelligence, uh, Kate uh, Crawford and uh, Trevor Paglen, that's, you know, is a very well uh, known artist for us because he has uh, uh, work around the topic of machine learning and, um, and, artificial, and, and images produced by artificial intelligence. So in this article, the two authors, the two artists questioned the uh, politics of images in machine learning training sets. 
this is the topic, uh, this is the title of the article, starting, uh, and they start from a very simple and obvious affirmation. Uh, they say, building uh, I, uh, AI systems require data. Supervised machine learning systems designed for object or facial recognition are trained on vast amount of data contained within database made up of many discrete images. They mention in their article this, the case of this database called the Japanese female facial expression widely used in effective computer research and development. Uh, the data set uh, contained photo photographers of uh, 10 Japanese female models making even facial expression that are meant to correlate with seven basic and emotional states. I won't obviously enter in, in detail. But my uh, final point is the following. Uh, when the cybercrime investigation uh, is still looking for and masking identity theft, this, the stealing of faces, the eruption of massively set of apparently nobody's face, the face generated by the artificial intelligence, uh, arguably checkmate the fake as a category and far to destabilize the face as a signifier of an individual identity. At the same time, by, uh, sorry, Something happened. Uh, can can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can. Uh, yes. The presentation. Yeah, the we presentation hear you, but, but uh, was the last slide, so I just finished. Oh, okay, okay, okay. It was I the last. It was the a, last. It was a, a catfish conspiracy. Yeah. Uh, so what? Uh, uh, my last. Um, my last sentence of the presentation was, in fact, at the same time, by advocating for a collective ownership of the face one can denounce a collective fraud. And this was uh, the end of uh, my presentation today. Uh, I don't know exactly, I, I will stop sharing the screen now because- uh, Yeah, yeah perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sorry, Soro. It, it's a very central topic uh, for our research project and uh, indeed, the um, uh, ethics limitations that we have to the quantitative part of our projects uh, somehow relate with this issue because uh, one of the preoccupations of uh, ERC ethics is that these images, uh, you remember when we wanted to work with the so-called Amazon Turks. So the worry was exactly that then these images could be back searched, but also used as images for um, catfishing. Um, so the, the floor is, is open for a brief session of uh, questions or comments or insights. I have many because this, this uh, um, topic of um, uh, identity theft really um, intrigues me, but uh, I want to um, a probe the audience first to see if uh, there are any urgent comments or, or questions. Well, a comment I, I would like to propose is that um, from a certain point of view, well, there, there is a um, sort of an attitude that is very common in social networks to um, uh, not to publish one's uh, facial image in order to protect it from uh, identity thefts. Uh, I wonder whether the opposite strategy is much more uh, effective. So if you have your, your face associated with your name and your activities and your life in many social networks and many platforms, nobody will be able to, to steal your, 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 your face. So you, you can certainly go on Tinder with Brad Pitt's face, but you can go on, on Tinder with the face of someone who actually is not present on social networks. So proliferation of facial images might actually protect you from, from face theft. What, what do you think about it, uh, Professor Soro? Thanks, thanks, Master. This is a, a very interesting and relevant uh, observation. In fact, um, what uh, made me um, 
what catch my attention while I was uh, watching this uh, catfish uh, TV program is just a, a naive way in which uh, the well the producer the presenter um, uh, conducted their forensic investigation into the uh, into the test. Of, of the face because basically what uh, the only action they did is doing this Google research, Google reverse, which is clearly if uh, uh, one has a profile in LinkedIn and a profile is uh, so uh, is a so uh, is so clear that the person that claim uh, you know that's is that is or her is someone else. So uh, of course there is, uh, um, and uh, what is relevant is not, you know, I'm not, we're not judging, you know, the, the quality of the TV program that's over target uh, and no, um, kind of not train public to these uh, topics such as, uh, they are not member of faces, but uh, what is uh, relevant is like in 2021, when also, of course, we are like surrounded by it, uh, deep fake, and there is a certain um, belief in the fact that still, uh, you know, uh, catfish, um, catfish is uh, still a uh, real face, and and that they can still a uh, real face in a way that they are not supposed to be uh, discovered by doing this very uh, easy Google research uh, uh, image. So of course, I think that is a is a is a is a very um, interesting field to observe from, especially from now on, because uh, what the, this program didn't take in into account is just the defect. In, in fact, if you remember the a short video at the beginning. It was very like, uh, you know, a bit of a uh, um, 19th century consideration about, yeah, there are filters, you know, you're not really, when I see someone in person, it's not exactly the same, but I think that face it uh, should be the uh, committee of expert of a uh, toast program and kind of complexify, you know, the level of stratification of a fake whether with the artificial intelligence or not. But of course, it's not just, you know, the direct uh, um, relationship between face and identity also, because we can have also uh, different phases uh, for uh, in, in, in different uh, occasions. So it's much more uh, complex and probably also the catfish. Um, I'm sure they are um, very uh, attentive to novelty. So we'll see what uh, is gonna mm. happen in this field. Yeah, I think this work is is really crucial also because um, I mean we are probably discovering more and more that there is a symbolical capital that is attached to the face, uh, which is a capital also of believability. And um, but uh, th there are probably areas of inflation, uh, and uh, this is probably one of them. But at the same time. You know the the realm of the fake is is more complex than that because if you think uh, uh, the faking of um, objects produced by luxury um, brands like Gucci, for instance, or, or Louis Vuitton, so you you can have uh, you know thousands of uh, Louis Vuitton or Gucci uh, objects, uh, uh, fakes of course, fake reproductions um sold uh, um, on the street uh, of many european cities but at the same time you still have louis vuitton and gucci shops that sell exactly the same objects for uh, like uh, very high prices yeah. so i wonder whether something similar is happening or will be happening to the face as well we'll we'll have a a, a uh, let's say street fake version of our face and then somehow we'll have to construct a Louis Vuitton flagship store in order to sell our proper face. So I wonder whether this metaphor rings a bell to you or, mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, that is, um, yeah, yeah, obviously it does um, in the way of, uh, you know, uh, the internet uh, is a store of faces where faces are uh, exposed and uh, also uh, the differences between uh, you know the uh, original and the replication and well, not replication but or the falsification of uh, 
of phase, uh, um, you know, is uh, much more, uh, it, well, it obviously it's different from in comparison with the uh, fashion products where, where, you know, we, we know that if we go to, uh, you know, a store in the main avenue of our city, that store will sell you the original. Whereas if you buy the same option in the street is, is very likely not to. In the case of the internet, well, I am very fascinated by this uh, massive container of, of images and even more uh, with, uh, with the introduction of, uh, of the deep fake that's also, of course, emulate uh, not, not just uh, um, common people face, but as we know, uh, uh, well, uh, person of interest uh, Phase. So well, of course, I like this. Uh, uh, yeah, th th that uh, you know the um, the forgery in 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 other fields has to be kind of a, um, a a way of contrasting what is happening with face uh, by making distinction and also uh, catching uh, commonalities. So of course, for especially for this topic, I have to uh, carefully uh, pay attention to other um, fields where forgery is uh, is uh, is happening. And let's see what. Happens. Including the academic one, you know, there are oh, many yeah. uh, fake journals and fake symposia. Maybe like faces are not used so much in this mm -hmm. uh, in these venues, but uh, I, I I wish uh, someone would come up with a nice paper on the topic one day. So thank you very much, Professor uh, Elsa Sor. It was really uh, intriguing and, and useful, I think, for our research group. But uh, we'll now give the floor to the uh, next talk uh, by Professor Antonio Santangelo, uh, University of Turin, uh, who is uh, um, tenor track, a assistant professor at the University of Turin and uh, uh, facets. Um, is well known in the semiotic community in Italy and elsewhere for his many studies on um, socio-semiotics, the semiotics of television, and recently more and more also because of his cooperation with Turin Polytechnic University on the semiotics of digital cultures. So today is going to present um, a talk entitled Weird and Eerie Faces. Uh, Professor Santangelo, thank you for your participation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Leone, for inviting me, and thank you, everybody, for being here. I share my presentation. Uh, here it is. Can you see it? Yes, we can. The, the okay, perfect. So I put it full screen. Okay. So for the ones uh, who don't know my research uh, in facets, I'm working on uh, the faces of our times. Uh, I'm studying uh, symbolic faces, faces uh, that symbolize cultural models uh, we recur to, to give a meaning uh, to our everyday life experience. I, a particularly work on uh, fictional faces, but not only on them. For example, here you can see the face of Chiara Ferragni, which I have, uh, that I have studied, uh, to compare it uh, with uh, faces of uh, uh, fictional characters like uh, Fiona in Shrek or Adele in La Vida Del. Uh, well, I'm working on um, uh, three. Uh, and as far as I believe that uh, the, the meaning of these spaces depends on the narratives in which uh, they are inserted. Uh, I'm working on uh, the three kinds of narratives uh, that up to Guido Ferraro in Semiotica 3.0, uh, we used to recur to to tell uh, our stories and uh, the stories um, that we share in our societies, uh, which are the alpha one, the beta ones, and the gamma ones. The alpha ones are about uh, identity. Uh, so we tell stories about the identity of characters uh, to reflect also on uh, our own identities. The beta stories are more like the mythical ones. So mm, they are stories in which um, we talk about uh, reality, the way it should work, and we try and reflect on uh, different ways of working on reality. And 
I'm studying the beta narratives. I'm working in particular on the narratives uh, on artificial intelligence and on the way we uh, conceive uh, our future. And uh, the gamma narratives are the ones in which um, uh, we used to reflect on how to construct the meaning of what we are telling. And also we used to, refer to reflect on how to find the meaning of uh, the world we live in. And uh, a movie that, uh, in my opinion, is very interesting um, nowadays is Little Joe, a movie from Jessica Hausner. It was... Uh, produced uh, last year in 2020. And uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this one. But anyway, let me tell you that uh, um, from my perspective, uh, all the narratives uh, I'm studying, uh, it doesn't matter if they are alpha, beta, or gamma, uh, they, um, they are against <laughs> Uh, the theory of the canonical narrative scheme of Grey Mass, because they talk about uh, looking for the right or true meaning of things that emerges as uh, and is uh, suddenly found. Uh, all the characters I'm studying, all the stories I'm studying, uh, don't talk about as uh, in Grey Mass uh, canonical narrative scheme. Uh, don't, they don't talk about a meaning that is found at the beginning of the story. So the meaning that is uh, connected with the values of the story and uh, actions that are meaningful because characters uh, start following their values at the beginning and stop doing it uh, at the end of their, uh, of their story. The, the, the narratives that I'm studying are um, more like narratives in which uh, characters start following some values, start seeing the world from a certain point of view that they believe is right and true to give a meaning to their experience in their worlds. And then suddenly they find out that their values, their codes, their way of seeing the world is wrong because something happens in their stories, something emerges very clearly in front of them and they understand that they have to change their way of, of seeing things. And um, this is something that I have studied um, uh, since uh, some years ago. Uh, in 2018, I had the chance of uh, working on the narratives uh, about um, catastrophes, uh, about um, you know, earthquakes or uh, uh, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I understood that this kind of narratives uh, have to do with another Grimasian theory, the, the Cézy esthétique, uh, which he, he wrote uh, in uh, De l'Imperfection. And I've also continued uh, to study this kind of narratives and uh, the theme of the Cézy esthétique, um, reflecting on um, what happened uh, um, nowadays uh, uh, in the COVID uh, time. Uh, and uh, so in this uh, other catastrophe, uh, something happens that uh, uh, forces us to change our mind, to change our way of uh, interpreting uh, the, the, the world in which, uh, in which we live. And uh, let, me, let me tell you that this kind of narratives, in my opinion, um, is uh, very diffused in our society in which uh, we are reflecting on the fact that uh, some of us are using the wrong old codes to give a meaning uh, to what's happening in the world, to what's emerging in our world, and uh, that we need uh, new codes. For example, here, uh, the, the opposition between uh, Greta Thunberg and uh, Donald Trump is very clearly connected with this kind of narratives. So something emerges very clearly, and you must find a new way of interpreting the world and of, and of behaving, a new way of behaving out of your way of interpreting the world. And if you don't do it, it's because you, you use the wrong old cause, old codes, and maybe also because you are a conspirator, because it's so clear that something is emerging that 
at least from the point of view of people like Greta Thunberg and people that use uh, this kind of narrative to give a meaning to their experience of the world, maybe the people that don't see this uh, reality emerging that clearly, uh, well, they have something to hide and uh, they have uh, some interests that uh, are against us. But let me tell you that um, there is a, um, an author that, I, that I'm reading nowadays and that I find uh, very interesting to reflect on this kind of narratives, that is Mark Fisher, who in his book, uh, Capitalist Realism, uh, said that uh, we uh, all believe that uh, capitalism um, is a sort of a code to read our experience of the world, and uh, it is a code that uh, has become a sort of a realism. We see the world through the lenses of capitalism, and, uh, and we also believe that people that see the world through other lenses, uh, they are not realist. They are uh, somehow mad or, uh, or strange people, no? uh, because uh, he explains that uh, after uh, the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall, uh, capitalism became uh, the only way of interpreting uh, economically our uh, experience of the world. And so Mark Fisher believes that uh, the, the capitalist realists uh, are the people that uh, use the wrong old codes to, 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 to read our experience of the world. And uh, these codes make them incapable of seeing that something is emerging uh, that uh, forces us to think uh, in another way, to think our experience of the world in another way. And then uh, he wrote a book, which was uh, the last one before uh, he, he committed suicide. Maybe you know that he committed suicide. All, all, Someone believes also because uh, he, was, uh, he was afraid that uh, there, there was no possibility of escaping from the codes of uh, capitalist realism. And so in the book, The Weird and the Eerie, he analyzed some narratives um, that in his opinion were very symbolic uh, to, to explain the world in which we live, the narratives that he called uh, weird, weird and eerie. For weird, uh, he meant uh, a particular kind of disturbance, uh, which calls into question a sense of uh, non-correctness. I, I apologize because I have translated uh, um, the Italian version of Fisher in English. So maybe if you have read it, uh, his book in English, you may find uh, different words. But anyway, I believe the sense is this one. So weird calls into question a sense of non-correctness. A weird entity or object is so unusual that it generates the feeling that it should not exist, or at least it should not be here. Yet if the entity or object is indeed here, then the categories used so far to make sense of the world cannot be valid. The weird, the weird thing is not wrong after all. Our con conceptions must be inadequate. And you can understand the reason why I connect uh, these uh, concepts that Fisher uses uh, to read fiction, because in his book, uh, you will see only analysis of uh, Lovecraft, uh, the Lynch, uh, Fassbinder, uh, and uh, many other authors. So he uses them to read fiction. But as uh, I will show you uh, in a while, he is convinced that these fictions uh, tell a lot about uh, the world in which we live and the meaning we should uh, give, it, give to it. But if you apply these concepts to the images that we have seen uh, uh, throughout uh, the, the lockdown, so for example, of the animals walking on the streets of our towns while we were closed in our apartments, well, you can find that these images are weird in the sense of, uh, of um, Fisher, and uh, may, they may also uh, uh, resemble the images of um, the 12 Monkeys, uh, famous uh, movie of uh, Terry Gilliam. And uh, for Erie, uh, Fisher uh, um, um, defines this concept in this way. Uh, as we have seen, the weird is constituted by a presence, uh, the presence of something that is not in its place. Eerie, by contrast, is a failure of absence or a failure of presence. 
the feeling of eerie occurs when there is something where there should be nothing or when there is nothing where there should be something. The basic enigma behind every manifestation of eerie concerns the question of agentivity, agency. In the case of the failure of absence, the problem concerns the very existence of agentivity. Does a deliberative subject really exist here? Are we not being observed by an entity that has not yet revealed itself? Think about conspiracy theories. In the case of the failure of presence, the problem concerns the particular nature of the acting agent. We know that Stonehenge was erected, so the question of an acting or non acting subject behind its construction does not arise. Instead, we must deal with the traces of a non deceased subject, of a now deceased subject, whose intentions remain completely unknown to us. So, Eerie as something with a, a hidden agentivity, something uh, uh, that uh, acts in our uh, reality, changes our reality, but we are not able to see it uh, very well. And also we are unable to understand it very well. And if you connect these theories, for example, to climate change, no? to the fact that uh, uh, we still, I still live in Torino and what I see out of my window are the same trees that I've seen in the last 30 years, but something seems to change and there is something eerie that is uh, acting, that is, uh, that is an agency that is changing my world in a very, in a very uh, in a very scary way, or of course, if we think about uh, uh, the conspiracy theories about uh, vaccines, etc., well, we may understand that uh, the, the, the notion of eerie is uh, interesting to understand the narratives uh, that uh, we uh, construct and exchange in our everyday lives. And, uh, and Fisher connects uh, very clearly uh, the concept of uh, eeriness to, to capital. Uh, and he talks about the eeriness of capital. Uh, he, he, he writes, at this point, we can finally answer the question of why a reflection on the eerie is so important. Since the eerie revolves crucially around the problem of agent, agentivity, it concerns the forces that govern our existences and the world. Especially to those of us who live in a globally teleconnected capitalist world, it should be clear that such forces are not entirely available to our sensory understanding. A force like capital does not exist in any material sense, yet it is capable of producing virtually any kind of effect. And this is the reason why I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Little Joe, because Little Joe, uh, in my opinion, uh, is about capitalism uh, and is about the eeriness of capitalism. Uh, uh, you can understand it uh, if you consider uh, what the, the flower, which is uh, the protagonist of the movie, uh, represents, you know, because the movie is about a flower that has been created by manipulating uh, the genoma of uh, plants. And uh, it is a sterile and artificial flower, which is unable to, to, to reproduce itself. But the scientists that are working on it start believing that it uses our minds. It uses our minds to reproduce itself uh, because um, uh, it's, um, uh, uh, I don't know the English for pollen, but uh, because it produces some uh, substances that we breathe and uh, go inside our brains and make us act uh, the way it wants. And uh, the, the, mm, the song, uh, which is part of the soundtrack, the, the main song, which is part of the, the soundtrack of this movie, is entitled Happiness is Business. Uh, and in fact, uh, at, since the beginning of the movie, we understand that if you take care of this flower, it will make you happy of reproducing it. And so if you think about what capitalism is, and if you think about that this flower will make uh, its producers very rich, and we understand it since the beginning, 
well, we may consider it a sort of a metaphor also of all the theories of, um, of um, Mark Fisher. And well, uh, I'm, interesting, I'm interested in the narrative uh, structure of this movie, which I consider uh, very representative, uh, symbolically representative of uh, a certain kind of narratives we used to refer to in our, in our actual lives. Well, the narrative is like this. We have this flower, we have uh, the camera that uh, is, fixed on its, oh, is fixed on this uh, flower. Uh, still, it is uh, still, uh, and it watches the flower to try and understand if the flower is truly the ruler of people and is truly uh, the, the, the eerie thing that uh, we, uh, have the intuition it is. And uh, we have to understand by watching the flower and we are not able to see uh, the, the, the small substances that it produces. Uh, so we have to understand uh, using science uh, if uh, it truly produces these substances that uh, drive our brains. We have to understand if it's true or false that the flower takes control of our mind. And who has to understand it? On one side, there is the creator of the flower, uh, which is a, who is a scientist, a workaholic scientist, uh, as everyone in her, um, in her uh, office. She works on a company that produces um, uh, flowers uh, out of uh, gene uh, manipulation. She's an individualist. Uh, we understand that uh, she has a split from her husband and uh, she only thinks about uh, working. And uh, she also has a child that she struggles to take care of because uh, she has to work all the time. And she's unscrupulous, unscrupulous because uh, uh, she manipulates nature without following uh, the ethical uh, rules uh, of uh, genetic manipulation because she believes that using some uh, viruses that are forbidden may uh, make science improve. And she's angry for success. And of course, uh, since the beginning, she believes that it's false that flowers take control of our minds. But uh, on the other side, there is a, another scientist in her office who is victim of burnout. Uh, she used to be workaholic, but uh, she had uh, psychiatric uh, problems for it. And she's considered to be a little bit full and she's very lonely in her office. Um, it seems that they give her a job uh, just because they have pity on her. But she's the first to understand that uh, also, which is the, the, the scientific theory that explains the reason why uh, the flower takes control of our minds. But nobody, but nobody believes her because um, they consider her a fool and um, oh, but well she's altruist because uh, she takes care of her dog uh, this movie is also ironic she's angry for love and not angry for success she's she's respectful of the rules of nature especially of nature uh, because she doesn't want uh, uh, sterile plants to be created out of uh, genetic manipulation because she believes it is unnatural. But anyway, on her side, the, 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 the scientist uh, uh, who creates the flower as her uh, boss, um, who uses science in many ways to, to explain that the flower is uh, is a normal flower and uh, it doesn't take control of our minds. And also she is on her side, her psychologist uh, who uh, tells her that all the concerns about, um, well, let me use the Fisher, Fisher words, the eeriness of the flower are only psychological problems that she poses on her uh, because uh, she feels guilty of not uh, having the chance of taking care of her uh, son because she wants to take care of the flower. And so out of the metaphor, she wants to take care of the money of the capital, etc. And she convinces uh, her, the protagonist, Alice is the name of the protagonist of the movie, that 
the right explanation is that the flower uh, is a normal flower and uh, that people uh, that want uh, to reproduce the flower are normal people uh, and they are uh, well they behave in a very normal way and let me also add that in this movie there is the problem that the if the flower takes control of people people have to act not to show that they are under the control of flower. They have to seem, they have to seem normal people. They have to seem uh, loving people, altruist people, respect, respectful people of the rules, etc. Just to uh, hide themselves out of uh, normal people and uh, to act as to reproduce, uh, to reproduce the, the flower. Uh, and uh, so, for example, Alice, um, the protagonist of this movie, has to understand uh, she, she, whether her son is uh, affected by the virus of the flower because she uh, gives a present of the flower to her son uh, because she wants her son to be happy by taking care of the flower, but then the son changes and it seems that this change is due to the flower taking control of his mind. And so she has to understand whether he has changed, if whether he is truly her son or not. So we have to deal with fake uh, ways of behaving, fake interpretations, etc. And here we see the eerie faces. Uh, well, well, the movie doesn't uh, only stare at the flower, but it also stares at the faces of uh, the characters uh, of, uh, of the story, uh, trying and understand whether they have changed or not, whether they are pretending or not, uh, whether they are true or false. And well, uh, well, let me explain uh, you the, the, the meaning of this word, narrative against science and psychology. Well, in this movie, we understand that uh, scientists try and do their best to understand uh, from a scientific point of view whether the flower is uh, infective or not, uh, but uh, the researches they conduct depend on, on, on narratives. They depend on the codes that they have to, to, to give a meaning uh, to their experience uh, of their job, of life, of the, of their, of the world, because the scientist that believes that nature must, must, mustn't be exploited, then she conducts some kinds of researches, while the scientist that believes that, uh, well, science, uh, that nature must be manipulated and uh, uh, transformed in something that has to be sold and uh, that helps us making money, makes some other kinds of researches. And so, the, the truth doesn't come out of science, but it comes out of narratives. So depending on the narratives that we have, uh, we use science in a way or in another uh, to defend no, the positions that come out of these narratives. And uh, of course, well, the movie is about the affirmation of a narrative or of another narrative by watching reality, watching a face that is still, is always the same face, the face of the son of uh, the protagonist of the movie never changes, but, but maybe something is changing in the interpretation of this face and we may understand that he is a, a slave of capitalist of capitalism or not, and also the flower is the same, no? And so, depending on the narrative that we use to interpret the face of the characters of this movie, we understand their identities, and of course, the face has a lot to do with identity. And so, we stare at the faces of these characters, trying and understand which narrative is right and which narrative is wrong to affirm the truth. 
And well, uh, let me conclude uh, with um, this notion of uh, unworldling and outside, which is connected to it. Well, Mark Fisher, uh, here I quote Gianluca Di Dino in um, the consideration that he writes uh, at the end of the book of uh, Mark Fisher. He writes that there are above all two concepts that run through the weird and the area supporting pillars and that make explicit fishes belonging to his cultural context. That of outside and that of unworldling. Above, we saw what we should mean by outside, a dimension that is alien to the categories of the human mind, that is not subject to, to its laws and that exists in spite of man. Therefore, it is in it, it Therefore, in his absence or without the possibility of exercising control over it, the category of external is both weird and theory because it involves the coexistence of entities that do not belong to the same dimension and confronts us with a non-human agentiveness. The concept of unwarning is more complex. Using this Heideggerian term, and well, I, I, I don't read it because I don't speak German, but you can read it, Fisher means as he writes in uh, analyzing Fassbinder's The World uh, on a String, an abysmal, an abysmal falling away from any idea that there is any fundamental level that can serve as uh, a basis or touchstone guaranteeing and authenticating was, what is truly real, which is, the point of, um, uh, which is the point of Little Joe, because in Little Joe we see these two narratives confronting each other and we don't understand uh, perfectly which one is true and which one is wrong. The movie is constructed until the end to make us wonder whether we have to uh, interpret, interpret the flower and the, the behavior of people in a way or in another. And so without going into the intricacies of the Degarian philosophy, we might speak of unworlding as the process of deconstructing the idea of world as a set of foundational semantics. And this movie is about this. It is about ascending instance from outside, uh, the flower that uh, takes control of our mind, that deconstructs our vision of the world and makes us wonder whether we see the world in the right way or not. But we remain uncertain. We remain in an unworldling situation because of something that comes from the outside. And in my opinion, and here I conclude, this has a lot to do with what we are living uh, today with the truth and post-truth, uh, with the COVID experience, the struggle of science uh, that is used by people that have the narrative A, the narrative B, the narrative N to construct the meaning of what's happening um, to us. And so I like to quote uh, the book of Anna Maria Lorusso, Post Verita, who says that uh, truth is a discourse, is an effect of a discourse, and also it is a discourse that uh, is connected with communities, uh, with the way we exchange this discourse between people we, we have faith on. And so she talks about a communitarian narrative uh, truth, uh, which is uh, the core of uh, this movie and the core, in my opinion, the movie I, I, Little Joe, and in my opinion of uh, the weird and eerie uh, narratives, and also of the discourse of Mark Fisher, who addresses us uh, to, to, to think about the codes that we use to read the reality, to invent new codes, to give it uh, different meanings and to share them. Because otherwise, uh, if we are uh, long, alone to use different codes, we may be considered uh, mad, like the protagonist Bella of the movie Little Joe. And here I finished, and uh, if you want, we can... Uh, talk a little bit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sant'Angelo. Uh, it, it was a, a particularly um, uh, hypnotic uh, presentation, meaning that uh, you took us in a direction that we did not expect, and uh, but with your usual style. So uh, starting from a particularly complex uh, movie text, and then uh, analyzing it, but using it also as a, as a starting point for developing further your own semiotics, socio-semiotics of uh, a contemporary um, cultures, including digital cultures. 
um, th these two uh, adjectives, the weird and the eerie, are fascinating. And at the same time, they have very blurry and uh, uh, and and um, uh, somehow undefined the semantics. So you really contributed uh, to uh, to define the semantics of these of these terms and maybe to introduce them as new meta terms of uh, El Semiotics. So thank you very much for your wonderful contribution. Uh, I, I, as always, I, I open the floor to comments or suggestions that I want to monopolize the, the discussion or the dialogue. And uh, I, um, I wonder whether there are any questions or comments. Uh, um, there is Gianmarco, Dr. Giuliana, who is, wants to um, ask a question. Gianmarco, go ahead. Hi, thank you, Antonio, very much. Um, I was uh, trying to uh, connect the first part of your presentation with the last part, and I thought about uh, the book of Roland Barthes, Le Degré Zéro de l'Écriture, uh, where the, um, there was a direct connection between the, the idea that uh, the social shape and ideological shape of our society is directly related to the kind of story. So in the beginning, you said that those stories, they are not really fitting very well, the Grimagian canonical schema, that are kind of different stories. There is this kind of different idea of truth after all, if I understood right. So do you agree which on, on this connection between the social changes about, which are also connected to the technological changes, of course, about truth, and the, the fact that the stories that we are creating, uh, as you seem to uh, to prove, uh, are changing in the in the structure. Do you think there is a connection between these kind of things? Is it only limited to some few stories, while the mainstream is still the same? Uh, capitalism, bourgeois, uh, to talk about uh, uh, bar terms. And finally about the, 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 this problem of, of the truth is socially evolving, uh, I would like to know if you completely agree with this idea that the truth is a discourse, uh, or if, uh, which is the version I prefer, uh, to say that the truth has always a discourse. Because if we say that truth is a discourse, there is the big risk of becoming negationist, of negating any kind of reality. So the fact that Antonio and uh, Sant'Angelo has two eyes, if I say that it is a discourse, then it means that there is no way to prove that this is true. While if we say that truth has always a discourse, then I think it is more prudent, let's say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, Gianmarco, um, instead of quoting Bart, uh, I prefer to quote uh, Prieto when talking about uh, truth and uh, structuralism, because uh, you know that I am a structuralist uh, semiotician, but as a structuralist, I don't believe that um, uh, structures, uh, as uh, for example, the structure of language or the structure of narratives, uh, the, et cetera, don't have any connection with the reality. Uh, Prieto in uh, Pertinence and Practice um, uh, explains as that um, any code makes pertinent out of reality some of its part depending on the practices that we want to carry on. And so, in my opinion, every narrative that uh, has connections with reality, and uh, as you can see uh, today, for example, out of the narratives of the conspiration uh, theorists, uh, they many times uh, used to recur to scientific studies uh, or uh, to uh, facts that happen in uh, our everyday lives. So they connect with something real. Uh, and they only put it in their discourses, making more pertinent or less pertinent some parts of reality or some others to construct uh, their kind of truth, which becomes uh, true in their opinions, in their opinion, because they share it with other uh, with other people that uh, follow the same uh, practices, no pertinence and practice. And so, uh, well, in my opinion, uh, this is the way 
truth uh, works uh, since the beginning of uh, our experience in the world <laughs> as human beings. And, uh, and what's happening today is uh, just that uh, some uh, narratives that we used to record to, to give a meaning to our experience of the world are falling. And people are starting to share other narratives that are very pertinent because they take parts of reality, parts of uh, the, the factual experience of the world inside of a certain kind of discourse and they share it. And, uh, and I like, the time in which we are living because it's a very semiotic time because uh, we are building codes, we are starting to share codes, also different codes. We will see what will happen. There are people who have a lot of money to make some codes uh, to affirm themselves and people uh, who have less money, but they are more than the people that have money. And so we will see. There is a Christina also. Thank you. Professor Voto, raise your hand. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Antonio, for the presentation on a film that I really enjoyed. So I really thank you for this choice. I have a curiosity to ask you, uh, which has been arousing my interest lately. Um, do you think that, um, do you think uh, there can be an interspecies process of identification and therefore an interspecies faciality because uh, in all the movie we see the face of this flower which is um, appearing and having its own agen um, agency if you remember we see the whole process of the creation of, of the species so i just i wonder if you had any idea about this interspecies Pieces thank you, broken. thank you very yeah. much, Christina. It's a beautiful question, and um, I didn't uh, think about interspecies, but I I thought about uh, uh, the interrelation between uh, the faces of people and the flower, because uh, because people stare at the flower <laughs> all the time, <laughs> and uh, their identity depends on their interaction with the flower in the movie. In my opinion, the flower represents uh, capitalism and the capital. And so it is very simple to understand the meaning of uh, this interaction. Uh, uh, there was also the idea that um, Alice, the protagonist, has to choose between her son and the flower because she considers the flower as her son too, because she has created it. And she has to. Uh, decide whether to take care of her son or whether to take care of the flower. And she decides to take care of the flower with the happiness of her psychologist uh, who tells her, you are right, because if you are happy to, to be the one that stare at a thing and gives her affection to a thing, it is OK. You only have to be happy. And if this makes you happy, it is perfect. But if you read, uh, if you read Mark Fisher and if you read uh, Essere Senza Casa of Gianluca Di Tino, who, who in my opinion is a very interesting uh, uh, writer about Mark Fisher, they tell that uh, capitalism has also colonized the, um, uh, our uh, uh, psyche, our psyche, our, our subconscious and uh, it has uh, become uh, it has constructed some good reasons to explain the reason why we like to be workaholic we like to find our identity in uh, growing up a thing or a flower happiness and desire have been colonized in this uh, sense. And so this interaction, I don't, I wouldn't call it interspecies, but inter objects between us and an object is uh, something uh, that works very well in the capitalist realism code. Uh, it is one code, it is an interesting uh, code in my opinion. Uh, uh, let's see if we want to consider it uh, in semiotics. In semiotics, it only has to do, in my opinion, uh, with uh, ascending instance. So a sender, no? a sender that uh, decides 
our destiny instead uh, of ourselves deciding our destiny. Thank you, Professor Santangelo. <clears throat> Are there any other comments or, or questions um, or insights? Um, yesterday I was jogging close to the Canal Saint Martin here in, in Paris and I I took a little passage, uh, one of these characteristic uh, Parisian passageways. And uh, it is not uncommon that uh, when you jog in Paris, you see some rats that seem to jog uh, alongside with you. But this time it was particular because one of them started to come closer and closer and then it, it actually hit me. So like there was a there was a clash between myself and the rat. I don't, know was, I don't I don't know if he was jogging or or not or what how he could conceptualize in his cognitive system that activity, but it, there was an interspecies a commonality in the fact that we were both shocked by the presence of the other, and uh, I, I don't know if that resonates with what you said. Absolutely, Massimo, it's fantastic. It's very weird, and uh, you have to be scared of the eeriness that took uh, the rat uh, against you, because uh, maybe there is something acting behind uh, your, uh, your, your, your capacity of uh, feeling that uh, is a uh, change in the world. But uh, we will understand it uh, because we are semioticians. We can see what's invisible. Semiotics, no, is uh, the feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe you wanted to provide me uh, with an example for today's um, <laughs> yes, uh, discussion after nice. your paper. Yeah. You never know. Uh, so um, uh, we are, um, now uh, slightly reformulating our uh, program because uh, fortunately Professor Marino will not be with us um, today. Uh, so we were supposed to take a little break. Um, I don't know, I, I, I enjoy this, this talk so much that I, I feel I don't need any break. I'm really impressed by the quality and variety of topics and uh, we meet very frequently, but every time I I listen to new talks, so I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed by the, the way you, you guys and girls, um, you professors and doctors, produce um, new materials within this research group. Um, at the same time, I know that changing the program, reformulating the program can be a sensitive thing because some people might join exactly at a certain time to listen to some lectures. So, Probably we should ask uh, um, uh, Professor Graminia if he, we, he wants to continue with a presentation and uh, or if you guys prefer to have a break now and then uh, continue later on. Um, there is no problem. If yeah. you want to keep on and continue, it's, it's okay. Yeah, so on break, it's fine too. Yeah, probably, uh, probably. I, I would continue because okay. I think there is a good atmosphere and okay. uh, good, uh, like, uh, cognitive tension among uh, all of us, uh, and maybe there is this eeriness or weirdness that okay. is uh, uh, that is in the air, uh, and, and of course we're gonna end a little bit earlier. And uh, uh, so, uh, without further ado, we give the floor to uh, Professor Raymond Graminia, who's also a postdoc at uh, FACETS, but he's also professor of semiotics, general semiotics at the University of Turin. Um, he has uh, a lot of experience in international research. He was at the University of Tartu for many years. And uh, we're very happy to um, listen to his talk entitled Poker Face on Concealing One's Face and Outsmarting Others in Strategic Interactions. Professor Graminia, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. I immediately share my screen and you should be able to see that immediately. Yeah, perfect. All right. So uh, thanks a lot, first of all, uh, to the organizers of this uh, symposia. And um, thanks a lot to Professor Leona for uh, letting this uh, online event uh, uh, happen. Um, as the title uh, suggests, uh, my job here today is to um, discuss with you the problem of uh, 
concealing one's faces in uh, strategic interaction, and also the idea of uh, outsmarting, uh, outsmarting others. I have to uh, admit uh, that uh, I've been uh, always uh, very much fascinated by the issues of, uh, of mendacity and the problem of deceit probably because of its uh, uh, intrinsic uh, complexity, first of all, but also because of its uh, creative edge, right? So there is a, a clear uh, connection um, between the, the work of creativity and the work of imagination from, from one side, and also the uh, job of a very skillful liar. As was uh, uh, pointed out by uh, Ruiz de Alarcón, a very good liar not only needs to have a strong memory, but also a skillful liar needs to have a very creative imagination, and, and rightly so. But also uh, Anna Arendt, she was uh, very sharp on the ball when she uh, pinpointed an element of uh, creativity within the production of each lie. So the idea of, of lying, the idea of deceiving is somewhat interlocked with, uh, with uh, uh, counterfactual thinking, with the capability of imagination and with the idea of possible worlds and with the idea of possibility. In fact, as she uh, points out, uh, and I quote from her book, uh, Lying in Politics, the deliberate uh, denial of the factual truth, uh, so uh, the ability to lie, and the capacity to change facts, so the ability to act, are in fact interlocked, they are interconnected. So they owe their existence to, put to the same source, which is in fact uh, imagination. So I found this, this nexus a very, a very fascinating area, first of all, hence my interest in the subject. But from here then, how do we connect and how do we conjugate the problem of falsehood on one hand and the study of the human face on the other, which is the subject also of our uh, ERC led by Professor Leone. Uh, let me tell you that this is definitely a very, very complex uh, subject and also a, a very, very slippery ground. So what I'll try to do in this short presentation, I will, try to uh, offer you some, um, some suggestions rather than a full-fledged theory about these issues. So what I try to do is try to connect the dots in a sort of fil rouge, in a sort of red line that connects uh, somewhat uh, uh, arbitrarily, I would say, uh, some authors and some theorists that have uh, talked about this issue. And hopefully I will try to trigger also your interest and perhaps your criticism, uh, let's say, on the subject. So uh, one question that we should uh, definitely ask ourselves is the following. Uh, do faces lie? A very, let's say, straightforward question, but also a, a very tricky question. And uh, there are different ways of uh, conceiving the human face in terms of uh, a false face or a fake face or a funny face. However, it is in plain sight that uh, stricto sensu faces don't lie because uh, lying has historically been conceived as a speech act. So if we want to be, let's say, quite uh, uh, strict and a little bit uh, too precise with our terminology, we probably should say that we do lie by means of words. In fact, we do lie through speech acts and therefore uh, stating that a face is somewhat lie in the literal sense of the word, that would be a far stretch statement. But don't let me wrong because Human faces do play a pivotal role, a significant role in all uh, settings of nonverbal communication. And therefore, for this reason, human faces can be disguised, can be dissimulated and can be feigned. So obviously there is a, a problem that needs to be unpacked there, right? 
And also, we should also remember that the idea of the subject is very much linked with the idea of persona. And persona, as you as, as you well know, as you well know, it is linked with the idea of uh, of the mask. Um, if we conceive of deception uh, through somewhat the facial features, then we should probably uh, put the idea of uh, facial deceit in the basket of, of simulation, which is a non-verbal type of deception. Once again, let me be very clear on this point because there is not a general agreement on such matters by the many scholars who have dealt uh, into this issue. So for instance, if you take the, uh, for us, uh, famous uh, semiotics of falsification and lying, which was uh, formulated by Umberto Eco, he uh, included lying and simulation in the same basket, in the same category of deceit. And he has distinguished uh, this, uh, this phenomena according to the house of the deception. So how deception is accomplished. On one hand, lying is accomplished through, uh, through speech acts. And on the other hand, it is, uh, let's say, simulation. There is a simulation which occurs not by means of words, but, but by means of uh, actions and behaviors. Now, when we think of uh, um, fake or false faces, probably we do immediately um, think uh, straight away to something along these lines. Here is a classic example of a famous musician, which is disguised as a street artist, who is not recognized by the audience in an impromptu performance. This was shown in a famous uh, uh, Italian um, uh, TV um, show, which is Report. And also another example would be a famous uh, football player like Ronaldo, who performs his uh, tricks in a in a place and who is disguised as a hobo or as a Trump. And in this uh, examples, false faces would take the form of masking, of, of camouflage and of travesty. And this is one area of investigation also uh, ex explore, explored by some of us in the previous years. Now, since the uh, uh, title, a wonderful title uh, provided to this, uh, to this uh, symposia, symposium by Professor Leona, is Digital Pinocchio, uh, which stems from a book that has created a long lasting myth. I thought that a good place to kick off this presentation would be to provide you with uh, a brief visual imagery around the liar. Although this uh, idea, the subject was already touched upon in the wonderful talk given yesterday by Professor Leone. So I will not uh, dwell very long on onto this uh, issue, ju just a few words. So as it is well known, uh, Pinocchio is a marionette and in some other uh, later translations of the book, Pinocchio becomes a puppet and he was made by the dexterity and by the creativity of, of, of Geppetto, uh, Pinocchio's father, who was indeed a very skillful carpenter. Car carpenter. Geppetto gives life to a creature, we have seen it yesterday, out of a piece of wood, and from there Pinocchio starts a life full of wonder, full of adventures, but also, as you know, full of, of misfortunes too. Uh, Pinocchio is well known because of his nose, uh, which is long and sharp, uh, which gets longer and longer each time he tells a lie. But actually, this is not uh, entirely accurate, because if we take uh, the uh, original style of Collodi, then you will notice that uh, Pinocchio lies three times, and uh, he lies firstly to the cat and to the fox in order to hide four golden coins. Uh, secondly, he lies to the fairy, and thirdly, he lies to an old man who asks him uh, whether he knew a little troublemaker called Pinocchio after the man suspected that this troublemaker had hit one of his schoolmates with a book on his head. And this is, and this is the third time. So out of, uh, of the three instances of lies, uh, Pinocchio's nose uh, grows only on two occasions. But anyway, we do recognize 
this uh, long nose as symbolic, as a symbolism of the liar, at least in, in Western culture. So I entirely agree with what uh, was said yesterday. If uh, the um, physiognomy of every liar's face would change at the speed and at the magnitude of, uh, of uh, uh, Pinocchio's nose, also outside the fictional world uh, constructed by Collodi in his magnific ma magnificent book, then we would be in a much better place than we are today. Um, to catch a liar is not at all an easy task and everyone who has been lied to at least once in their life knows and is aware of this point very much. Long noses or short legs. Now from uh, Pinocchio, let us move back a few hundred years. Ancient uh, iconography depicts the lie as being uh, some, sometimes limp and, and sometimes as holding a mask in its hand in order to show exactly that the lie has indeed a double face. This idea uh, was epitomized in Augustine's well-known characterizations of the liar as being duplicitous. The lie has two faces uh, because as Saint Augustine pointed out, the liar has a core duplex, so two hearts, a double heart, as Augustine would say. The uh, integrity of a person uh, resides then in the alignment with his own heart, whilst in the lie, there is then a gulf, there is a mismatch between inward thoughts, inward thoughts and outward speech. If we want to translate this concept in a modern uh, characterization, then we can use the concept of congruence and authenticity. For example, uh, Carl Rogers, the psychologist, uh, pointed out that there is something called subception. And the subception is a sort of sixth sense, uh, bottom-up bodily feeling, which can be used to determine whether a subject is being incongruent or inauthentic. If we go back to the uh, iconology of uh, Cesare Ripa, the lie is depicted as limp and the dress of, of the woman shows several, several faces, several masks. Likewise, if we uh, take a look at the frog, this is represented as a woman with uh, two faces, one young and one beautiful, and the other one old and ugly. From the side of the face of the younger woman, the figure holds in its hands two hearts, exactly as Augustine had pointed out, so the symbol of duplicity. And from the other side, from the side of the old woman, uh, the hand holds a mask. If you pay attention to the lower part of the figure, the legs of the figure end with clothed feet, whilst behind them you can glimpse from the dress of the fraud this stinger tail like a scorpion. I cannot dwell longer, I have to go quite fast to, to be able to say everything I want to include in this presentation. But the idea, just let, let me tell you that the idea of the multiplication of the faces is, is, is present in many representations, as for instance, the allegory of prudence painted by Titian where we have three faces, the faces of an old man, the faces of a mature man, and the faces of a young man, which are coupled with the three heads of animals below under the figure. We have a wolf, a lion, and a dog, the symbols of the time that the sage is able to master by learning the lessons from the past experience. And this is the old man wolf, or in order to act prudently in the present, this is the man lion, and in order to lay the foundations for the future. And, and that's the uh, young man and the dog. If we take a look at physiognomy, what, what we find in there, we find what follows. For example, that in men's representations of faces, a weak or receding chin should signify falsity for some reason. A good example of a such association of ideas can be found in Jan Kaspar Lavater's physiognomics. 
in which a receding chin uh, coupled with uh, very tiny and astute eyes indicates somewhat uh, the lack of sincerity. What's the point? The deception of the, uh, uh, the, the depiction of the liar based on uh, the facial features as uh, depicted in the physiognomy is very much uh, wobbly ground. Physiognomy has often provided false representations of types and characters which have triggered a very harsh response uh, of scholars, very eminent scholars such as uh, Georg Lichtenberg and Rudolf Kastner who have pointed out numerous uh, flows of such false representations or of false faces. It is not um, a mere coincidence uh, that I concluded this brief excursus of the imagery of the liar by mentioning Jon Kaspar Lavater. In fact, there is a, a very important a turning point in the history of physiognomy that bears a significance for the subject I'm discussing here today. This uh, turning point occurs in the debate around the human face between two distinguished scholars, Johann Kaspar Lavater, indeed, and Georg Lichtenberg. There is a key distinction, which I think is very useful for us in this debate, that is the difference between physiognomy on one hand and pathognomy on the other end. Whilst uh, uh, physiognomy is the study of the fixed or static traits of the face, then pathognomy, on the other hand, is concerned with the study of the dynamic of the mobile facial features. And I would say that this uh, point is very much worth pondering. The breakthrough of Lichtenberg is quite a revolution in this history of, in this cultural history of the face. In fact, for the first time, the human face takes on a dynamic dimension, which not only entails the possibility of change and the possibility of transformation, but includes mutatis mutandis also the capability of deceit, the capability of cunning and manipulation. The debate uh, between Lavater and Lichtenberg not only marks then a turning point in the history of physiognomy, but as I will show you in a minute, it also has some important ramifications for the idea of faking the face. According to Lavater, it is important to point out that physiognomy um, is conceived, in fact, as the investigation of the fixed forms of the face and the body and as an objective and an ontological meaning that allows to know, uh, allegedly, uh, that which a man is. But Lichtenberg flips over, completing, flips over completely this paradigm. In fact, he uh, concludes that this idea of the study of the fixed forms of the face should be rejected and we should replace it with the study of the mobile fa facial expressions known as pathognomy, which reveals not only what a man expresses, but also what a man simulates to express in a given moment and in a specific context. But there is more to it. The objective and the ontological meaning of the observation of the physiognomy should be switched with a subjective and therefore probabilistic meaning of the face. The distinction between an intuitive and a symbolic approach, which is probably a, of the physiognomy, and the practical and rational approach, which is proper of pathognomy, is an important distinction that's found is, is magnitude in this um, the distinction between Lavater and Lichtenberg. So to sum up, with Lavater uh, and Lichtenberg, the latter conceive, conceives the, the, the face as a category of time and of temporality and mobility. Now, during the uh, last years of the 18th century, Lichtenberg was able to visit London and had the opportunity to study very closely a great actor such as David Garrick of which Lichtenberg greatly admired this chameleon-like ability to change face through the art of dissimulation. In fact, the letters from England written by Lichtenberg revolves around the figure of an actor, which is the, which is the quintessential element of transformability, of mutability, and of uh, dynamicity of the face. 
So I, I agree very much with what Gurisati uh, calls the chameleon-like man, which basically entails the possibility of changing face with will. In Lichtenberg, thus, there can be found a semiotics of passions, a semiotics of feelings, and a semiotics of emotions, avant la lep. Uh, this um, semiotics of passions represents the study of the natural signs of the movements of the soul, in other words, the language of involuntary gestures and of mimic expressions. Now, the linchpin that should be drawn from a uh, Lichtenberg view is that not only the face becomes then the involuntary medium of an expression, but it also becomes the voluntary means of the representation of the subject. So in other words, face becomes the tool used by the subject in order to dissimulate his thoughts, his intentions, his state of minds, and even his own character. So Lichtenberg is quite clear on to this point, and I quote, the mobile features of the face show and enumerate not only involuntary pathognomic movements, but also the voluntary movements of simulation. Here we come full circle. For Lichtenberg, the face is regulated by the eye, the individual who can not only manage to control his own emotions and their respective mimic expressions, thus hiding something that exists inside, but doesn't want to leak out outside. But also the face, according to Lichtenberg, is able to produce facial expressions that are altered and artificial and thus can simulate that which does not exist inside and must want to show outside. Thus with Lichtenberg, we have the face used as a device of the simulation, we can say. Now, from this, we can extract two opposite ten ten tendencies, and then from here, I will go to the final remarks of my speech. So we can sketch out two opposite tendencies in the discussion around the human face. Very generally, we can say that the first front conceives the subject as uh, expressed by the unique expression of his own face. But at the same time, this trend towards the expression of the subject through the face is coupled with uh, a counter tendency of hiding, of masking, of dissimulating this same expression. This dichotomy is evident in the research carried out by Jean-Jacques Courtin and Claudine Arroche, who singled out some paradoxes of the face, which you can see in the slide, expression versus silencing of the face, revealing versus masking, showing versus hiding. I fully endorsed the, the thrust of a Curtin and Arroche approach to the study of the face, which should include not only the history of the emergence of the expression of the face, but also the silence of the face, so to speak, the way of controlling the face, of hiding the face, of silencing the face in different contexts, in different epochs, and in different, in different cultures. And this perspective matches very well the expectations of a history of ideas and a history of semiotics too, that seeks to fill not only the history of presences, but also a series of absences of a particular idea of concept. From, from this point, I should uh, now conclude and go to the, uh, let's say, subject uh, matter of this paper, which was the idea of strategic interactions. First of all, I should clarify that the idea of strategic interactions uh, referred into the title is not, let's say, self-explanatory, so it needs some specification. As you know, this term uh, comes from the sociology of Irving Goffman, and it means basically the games that people play in the face-to-face -face interaction. Probably a more straightforward, a more clear definition would be interpersonal strategies. So Goffman, as you know, have described such interactions in the following manner, and I quote once again, 
Each player must influence his own decision by his knowing that the other players are likely to try to dope out his decision in advance and may even appreciate that he knows this is likely. So courses of action or moves will be made in light of one's thoughts about the other thoughts about oneself. There are several types of strategic interactions. And here in these settings, the idea of predicting what the others will do is very problematic. Some examples are the following, two chess players, two poker players, stock uh, markets and uh, analysts and investors, uh, military strategists, also lawyers uh, before a judge or a jury, uh, boxers, but also you can add, if you want, couples in a courtship, criminals and detectives, and perhaps also teachers and students and spies and counter spies and the fourth. So in all these uh, cases, each party in the, in the interaction has a very strong interest in knowing what the other is thinking or how the other will, will react to any possible move, gesture or statement. Knowing what the other is expecting or knowing how the other will react imparts a very important advantage in these cases. Commonly, concealing one's own plans and intentions also is advantageous to the respective parties in such interactions. A case in point is the game of, uh, of poker. Poker is, uh, by definition, a game in which deception is expected and constitutes the rule of the game. The expert uh, poker player represents the quintessential manipulator. A professional poker player, in fact, should be able to conceal and camouflage his own real feelings behind a repertoire of deceiving behaviors. Disguising his true emotions is the hallmark of the manipulator as well as of the professional gambler. A professional uh, gambler uh, fits, uh, um, fits very well the phenomenology of the manipulator as was outlined by the psychologist Everett Shostrom. The manipulator here would be the type of controlling. In fact, he is someone who uses deception, phoniness, he uses a host of tricks and techniques and play roles in order to create a false impression. Besides the proclivity to deceit, the manipulator, as well as the poker player, has a proclivity to control. As Shostrom pointed out, the manipulator plays games like a game of chess. He appears relaxed, yet is very controlled and controlling, concealing his motives, from his opponent. The element of control is evident in the control of the body language and the control of facial expressions. A professional gambler is a player who is trained to complete impassivity, to show an impenetrable face. Indeed, the expression poker face refers to the ability of the professional gambler to hide somewhat his true feelings and to disguise his emotions in order to cheat or outsmart his adversary in a strategic interaction. Another key feature of the manipulator as well as the professional gambler would be the cynicism as well as the distrust. He doesn't trust others and he expects to be deceived. So he must counteract to these strategies. Players uh, of poker can use both verbal and nonverbal uh, language in order to produce false expressions of weakness or strength, of expertise or of lack of expertise, even of luck or bad luck. In the game of poker, there is a sophisticated form of deception, which is bluffing. It was thanks to two mathematicians, John von Neumann and Oscar Mongenstern, in the book called The Fear of Games and Economic Behavior, that made the first systematic study of the subject. As they pointed out, uh, of the two possible motives of bluffing, the first is to give an impression of strength in weakness. The second is the desire to give an impression of weakness in strength. I'll just now give you a few conclusions and then I'll open the floor for discussions. 
In strategic interactions where deception is part of the game, each party decides that the next possible moves to take according to the prediction made about the moves of the other are important. The strategy involves uh, involved in such context set uh, processes and skills of high cognitive order. The production of a successful deceit entails then a sophisticated set of assumptions by the deceiver who must calibrate his own moves and tailor it on the base of the image of the other. There is a kind of mutual modeling between the parties in such interactions, calibrating and recalibrating plans of actions, anticipating and guessing the moves of the other, disguising and dissimulating intentions are part of the game. Whether the face in this game of skills can be entirely faked or whether it can be entirely read is an open question, but definitely it lets the game going. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gaminia, for this uh, very rich talk that you have delivered with your usual elegance, uh, uh, with many references to important materials from the past, including beautiful Ripa's uh, Econologia, of course where you have not only the fraud, not only the lie, but also uh, the so-called disinganno, which is uh, the coming out of a fraud, you know, which is represented as someone coming out of a fishnet. Um, it is beautifully represented by Querciolo in the Cappella San Severo in Naples. But uh, I give the floor now to comments and suggestions uh, and, uh, and uh, um, objections, uh, and, uh, whatever you might contribute to this talk. There is a um, um, uh, raised finger this time, Marco, Dr. Marco Viola. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, but the volume is not really so. Uh, please. So perhaps now it yeah, should be better. Is, now. That is better. That is better. Yeah. Thank you. So. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Remo, for this nice presentation. It rings not only one bell, but actually many bells. And now that I'm beginning to collect some of your talks, I'm beginning to see the pattern here and the big picture, which I'm craving for, for seeing in its full. Uh, I have not, not one, but rather two questions. So maybe I'd, I'd begin with the former and leave the other, just in case there's some time left. So. The former question is, uh, as you might expect, uh, um, many of the bells that you ring when, when giving this talk uh, are uh, echoes to some uh, theories in psychological thinking, especially uh, some very odd topics nowadays. And I'd like to mention three of these topics to, to see whether you are familiar with or curious about one or, or more of these and if you have ever met them and if you have any reflection on, uh, because I think they are a nice parallel and a different way and approach to say anything. The first one is, of course, the theory of mind. As you know, uh, as in psychology and philosophy of mind, people are very much concerned about, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of debates about how we uh, predict or represent mental states of uh, someone else. And one of the main uh, tension is between uh, the so-called theory theory, that is, uh, I make an abstract and uh, cold mental model, like, like propositional uh, attitudes, grids, and it's very mechanical. And the other one, which is uh, increasingly popular after neuromirror uh, rhetoric, I'd say, is the simulation theory. Like, I see you are like making faces and it's, it resonates with me. And of course there are hybrid theories and, and, and this is the first one. But then uh, another uh, partially inspired by that, but going moving forward, there is this recent uh, vogue I'd say, which is not axiological, but it, it's very, very obnoxious. It's everywhere. The predictive processing uh, account of the mind, basically, after many decades without a general theory of the mind and brain, now people are jumping on and saying, look, I've got the ultimate and all encompassing definition of what the brain does. It predicts the worlds around us, including other agents 
believe. So we are all about prediction. We try to predict and even act action is prediction in, in a way, weird way that is not our interest in the moment. So I wonder where, whether you have met one of them. And the third one is um, game theory, of course. I'm not very familiar with game theory, but I know so that behavioral economists in particular are very much in interesting in game theory. And they also added the layer when there is evolutionary game theory. That is, it's not one only one, one game standing, but there are multiple matches. So you have got information about the player. So you know that whether Remo is a de deceiver poker player, a prudent poker player. And so you can... Uh, base your strategy on uh, on your information which might be deceitful but, but still so i wonder whether you have ever yes. met one of these topics and uh, and whether they are interesting or uh, like something or whatever okay. thanks. thanks a lot uh, dr viola for always uh, uh, inspiring hints so i'll start from the third point which is the game theory the game theory was uh, uh, referenced into the paper and it's one of the inspirations that I got to include the, the idea of poker face and bluffing, which stems exactly from, from their elucidation on the subject. So it's definitely something I have taken into account. But obviously the, the let's say, perspective from which I, I take, or at least I took this paper today, is a different one. They, at least in the first book, a systematic book on game theory, they try to develop a mathematical model, which is something absolutely great. But from my view, uh, I was trying to connect different dots in order to have a sort of a mapping also in the historical settings of the study of the face and cultural settings, how this would, 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 would be in place, but definitely a uh, point taken. As for the first point, the there is a huge literature about mind reading in philosophy of language, and uh, and I have myself uh, read this uh, let, let's let's say articles and researches, and and have included also them in my let's say research papers published already, and uh, and I have tried to let's say uh, let uh, uh, conversate let's say the classical uh, semiologists or semioticists. Umberto Eco and Morris and others with more recent theory of mind. In fact, the idea of you know mind reading it comes from that sort of uh, approach. Uh, I have to also say that probably there is a sort of uh, um, you know um, disciplinary status which is quite evident in uh, in the, in the publication of these papers. But as for my own type of research. I would definitely benefit from from uh, from uh, from those type of psychological studies. And the second point, also, I mean, the idea of uh, of uh, prediction, it's uh, it's uh, evident in many fields. And I would say that an interdisciplinary outlook onto these issues is something we all eager for. So, uh, my idea to 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 have uh, different peoples working on same topics is still, let's say on the board. So it's more like an invitation <laughs> for anyone who comes from different fields to dialogue with those who have uh, um, a different, let's say, approach. And um, probably also one thing I should mention is that uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, focusing on uh, strategic interaction, so-called strategic interactions, it's uh, it's perhaps you know a micro analysis that would make things a little bit easier because in my uh, paper I don't claim that those two tendencies are spread all over the places. So I I I am not hundred percent sure. In fact, that there is like I said in the conclusions that uh, the possibility of reading or unmasking a face would happen in every every in every face to face interaction. But in the case of strategic interactions, when one knows that that's already the, uh, the rule of the game, then obviously you must have some, some knowledge, some awareness, some training about those issues. Then whether this is, uh, um, is um, successful or not, uh, uh, we should uh, test empirically. Good, thank you. Um, Thank you, Professor. I, I think there's more time for a further question, but first I'd like to let the floor to 
Yeah, well, because uh, Professor Soro has a question. Then, if there is some time, of course, we'll continue the discussion. With, uh, but there is also a question by Silvia. So, uh, Elsa, go ahead, Professor Soro. Thank you, Massimo, I will be I will be quick. First of all, uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Remo. Wonderful uh, presentation and also a very nice shirt. So I have to tell you. Uh, well, my query is is um, is more uh, a curiosity actually. Um, my curiosity is uh, if whether there is uh, a codified system of uh, poker uh, faces and also potential tells in the uh, you know within the professional gamblers. Uh, if there is something that also has been studied as such. And also what happened when, uh, as, I, as I guess uh, is also happening, that gamblers um, playing online at the distance. So which could be the uh, role of the screen in mediating such uh, interaction among uh, poker faces? Yeah, thanks, uh, Professor Soro. I think they are both uh, excellent remarks. I'll start from the second, the idea of having a, a code of facial, uh, let's say, uh, simulations within a poker match. I think uh, that uh, uh, there would be some, but at the same time, it is a code which, uh, uh, let's say, uh, falls into the basket of, uh, of the secrecy, something that is, uh, let's say, known uh, prob pro probably uh, among those who are uh, professional gambler. I have tried to get in touch with uh, people who are basically uh, practicing this, this game uh, as a profession, but uh, I haven't had the possibility to come to some conclusions for this paper. But certainly it is an avenue that I should consider if there is a code and if I manage to get to know what the code is to you know, perhaps write something about it. Uh, the second question in, in, instead, the question of uh, online gaming, it's uh, more complicated uh, in a way, but also more simple on the other way. It is more complicated simply because the idea of, uh, of, of uh, opacity through the screen, it's, uh, it's self-evident. So you, you can play without obviously showing your identity, without showing your, your idea of, um, of verbal and nonverbal language. However, the, the possibility of bluffing, it's uh, as such, but not bluffing through the uh, face simulations, it's still there because you, you can bluff to be in a strong positions whilst you are in a weak and vice versa. You can bluff to be in a weak position whilst you, you are in a, in a strong. Probably they will, they will develop a sort of uh, um, uh, emoticons or emojis that <laughs> could be used as a sort of signals into these games, but uh, it is certainly something I should look into more details. Thank you. Thanks, Remy. Well, this yeah. is, this is really, thank you very much. Uh, both of you, it's really fascinating. And actually, I propose to you uh, for our next uh, seminar connected with the um, um, course of um, uh, philosophy of communication that we invite a professional poker player, wow. uh, like someone who is uh, also able to <laughs> reflect on, on his or her um, activity uh, to, to like, tell us something more about it. I think it would be really, really interesting. Um, I know that in many cases, sunglasses are worn, but uh, in some tournaments, they are forbidden. There is a um, uh, wonderful, since Professor Gaminia, you have uh, still connections with uh, the Baltic countries. Um, there is a wonderful uh, movie, short movie by Herz Frank, who was a fantastic um, um, Latvian uh, documentary filmmaker. It's called 10 Minutes Older. It's, uh, it's actually the face of a little uh, uh, child that is shown while he watches a pep show. It, so it shows all the, the different changes of facial expressions on the face of this baby. And then um, Hertz Frank uh, goes to meet the same uh, child uh, 25 years later and he has become a poker player, professional poker player. 
and you see the difference because now his face is uh, completely um, emotionless and motionless. So it's uh, it's an interesting reference, I believe. Um, and also we must underline the fact that there are uh, card games. Uh, probably we should uh, ask uh, Mattia Thibault about it, but Perfect. there are card games in which um, uh, couples play and then cues, uh, including uh, like little movements uh, made uh, through the face are fundamental to coordinate uh, and to uh, secretly coordinate. So, but there is, a, I think, an inside question from uh, Professor Barbotto. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gramigna, for your wonderful presentation. And I think my question was um, somehow already uh, answered a little bit because it was very short and very directly. And it was about uh, this uh, um, digital dimension eventually insert in this kind of uh, uh, interaction that you mentioned and which kind maybe of indicators would change uh, and which kind of uh, suggestion you, you, you can think about uh, uh, this, uh, this other uh, the digital dimension about your paper. Thank right. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Barbato. Uh, yes, uh, I am a thumbs up for this. Uh, first of all, uh, it would be really, you know, inspiring and fruitful for all people who have knowledge in fields where, uh, you know, I myself or others lack to, you know, put them together, these com com competencies. Uh, there is certainly, like I said previously, room to explore in this field and already Professor Leone has hinted at some ways in which we can go further for an exploration of uh, those types of questions in a different settings, in the settings which include a digital dimension. At present, I have not uh, delved, you know, uh, with the uh, degree of devotion and care that I want into these issues, but uh, it is certainly a good way uh, how to proceed in this research if I want to proceed along these lines. But um, definitely a good point. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think the key word there is prediction. And uh, Dr. Viola was mentioning it as well because it's a big word in neurosciences, you know, like um, there's a lot of investigation about uh, how the frontal part of the brain is used for prediction. But it's also uh, the big word in artificial intelligence because uh, what there still distinguishes artificial from natural intelligence is uh, the inability of artificial intelligence to predict uh, in non-finite uh, um, systems of variables. So uh, it, it, is, it is very easy to train artificial intelligence to become um, a world um, chess or Go champion but it's very difficult to train artificial intelligence to drive a car. And for us all, driving a car is um, absolutely like easier than, than winning a, a chess tournament. But for a machine, for artificial intelligence, it requires um, a, a complexity of prediction, which is difficult to achieve because it is not exact prediction. It is another kind of prediction, an embodied prediction, which is different, difficult to model into artificial intelligence. And this is something that um, probably goes in the direction of applying this uh, uh, theory also to the digital prediction of the other's face. Absolutely. Can, can I say the last yep. three things, please? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. Uh, because I haven't had time to include them into the presentation. One. Uh, important thing is that, uh, uh, as you very much know, and you already have discussed in some uh, uh, settings, also the idea of uh, uh, the creation through the artificial intelligence of, uh, of the fake videos, basically, it is based on this idea of outsmarting an intelligence. So one goes to uh, outsmart the other, the other tries to outsmart the, the, the first one and vice versa, and building up on this idea of predictability and outsmarting others. The second point I want to mention is that, of course, in the uh, neurosciences, we have a, a Nobel Prize in Italy, which was the uh, Rizzolatti, who has uh, discussed the idea of mirror neurons, which obviously you know, come into 
the frame here as well, all the idea of empathy, of trying to see what is similar to you. These are all ideas that, you know, I couldn't include in one single paper, but definitely, you know, they have a go, they have, they, they have a say into this, into this questions. And the third and last point is that uh, obviously there was Ekman that should be mentioned here, Paul Ekman, which was, you know, as uh, Professor Viola knows very well, uh, one of the founding fathers into this uh, idea of uh, dismasking, this, dismasking the face. And so the references are, uh, are good old Paul Ekman, yeah. <laughs> These references are uh, all making a frame of references for us, which is to be taken into account. Thank you. Well, that, that's uh, very insightful. And uh, I also propose that probably, you know, the third year of uh, ERC project facets is about to start and uh, we uh, are going to devote it mainly to um, systems uh, of reading of, uh, of the face uh, in different settings from antiquity until uh, nowadays. I think prediction should be really a key word in, uh, in uh, uh, many of our activities during this this year and probably also Dr. Viola might help us with organizing uh, a, a stream of, uh, of these uh, uh, seminars on the sciences of the face uh, on this idea of uh, you know the, the the neurosciences of prediction which I think are very important. Um, I was listening today to an interview to in um, in French radio to Yann Le, Le, Le Cun who is a um, guru of um, artificial intelligence, is one of the most important people in, uh, in Facebook and uh, is of French origin. And uh, he was stressing the fact that uh, Facebook is mainly working on prediction at the moment. Yeah, exactly. This is the, uh, we cannot see the, the title because you have probably amassed the uh, background. Uh, yeah, but Quand la machine apprend, it's a wonderful book that he has published. I think it's Odile Jacob, uh, the, the, the publisher. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, Odile Jacob. Yes, Le Camp. Le Camp is from Odile Jacob. This is nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so it's, it's a nice, right. nice reading. Nice reading. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. It was a fantastic talk and uh, it uh, really stirred uh, a wonderful. Um, um, uh, debate among us. Uh, thank you also to our director, uh, Professor Kukio, for being so attentive <laughs> and always on the spot. Uh, but we, we continue with the next uh, presentation, if you don't mind. I don't feel tired, I feel excited. So, I, but if you feel we can take a break, you know, I personally think we are in a very right mood. Um, so I would give the floor immediately to Gianmarco Giuliana, who is also a postdoc. Um, researcher at uh, FACETS, University of Turin, uh, is um, the uh, latest researcher in joining the group. We're very happy because he's working on important projects uh, uh, concerning the face in the gaming and also the gamification of the face. And, uh, and today he's going to talk about the semiotics of meta-human faces, which is, I'm, I'm really eager to, to listen to him because I've used this example but without knowing the details to match on many occasions. So this is gonna really add a lot to my knowledge of, uh, of the topic. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Juliana for, uh, uh, Dr. Juliana for this, uh, for this uh, contribution. The floor is yours. Thank you, Massimo. So can you see the presentation well? Yes, we see it. it it's not in the presentation mode, but we yes, see it. it. I am trying to solve the problem. Okay. Now you should uh, see it. Okay. So, um, so thank you, Massimo, and hi to everyone. I'm very happy to be here. So, today we're going to talk about meta human faces. And you will see in a second what is a human, meta human face. But more importantly, we are going to talk about the relation between the fact of recognizing a face as a true face and our experience, uh, which is granted by face. So let's start by looking at the one minute trailer of Meta Humans, and after we will continue.
Okay, so this was the trailer, the launch trailer in February 2021. So it's very recent. The beta was opened in April 2021. Uh, so as you have seen, it is a software to create amazingly realistic digital faces. Uh, what is interesting about metahuman faces, however, is the idea behind metahuman faces. So when we look at uh, one of the main creators beyond metahumans, we see a lot of interesting things. Well, first of all, digital humans and the word digital humans is interesting as well, uh, are a reflection of ourselves. They are designed so that we can learn through metahumans. So they are not only a representation of humans, but they are so realistic that we can use them to better understand ourselves. Um, Massimo was talking earlier about the fact that we, gave, we could have some fake faces going around. Well, for example, metahumans could be such technology because, uh, of course, if your face is exactly like yourself, then you can try your dress or anything you want, a pair of glasses, for example, and you can buy it on your metahuman face instead of your real face. Indeed, digital humans are considered one of the fundamental building blocks of many technologies of the future. So they are not mainly a representation, some, something which is realistic, but they are a technology which is made to be part of, of further technologies. Uh, what is extremely interesting is the fact that MetaHumans was created uh, and is specific because its database was uh, all based on 3D scanning of real humans. And they call these actual real plausible human faces uh, so that it is important that they are believable. So uh, interestingly enough, when we think of the, when you look at the history of CGI, uh, new uh, the technologies beyond metahumans are very like what Massimo Leone in the latest entry of Lexia was describing as the difference between painting and photography. So we had realistic CGI long before metahumans and 3D scanning, advanced 3D scanning. However, uh, the indexicality given by 3D scanning and so on is allowing for a radical shift in realism, which is very similar to the difference between paintings and photography. Even more interesting, uh, the creators of metahumans, they are not interested in the fact that metahumans sh should not look digital. They want a pleasant looking digital character. So digital humans may be naturally looking even though they are digital. So they don't care about the uncanny valley ear. Of course, they care about the fact that such faces must not be disturbing, but they don't care about the fact that such faces have to be true. So when we make a brief analysis of the clip that we have seen and these kind of quotes from the creators, we see a lot of interesting things. First of all, MetaHuman's faces wants to cover the wall aspects of the face. We have one of many, I, can, I could be one of many, so there is intersubjectivity. Metahuman faces look like other faces. They may look like your friends, like your sister and so on, or they be, may be very different from the people you know. But at the same time, I could be the one, they say. So there is subjectivity, there is the idea of the uniqueness. So they do not have types in a certain sense, but they are tokens, they are unique, they can represent subjectivity. Uh, Another point important is that they say, you create the narrative, I am the metahuman. It is clearly anti physiognomy So any face can mean anything. This is extremely interesting. Any face can have behind any kind of history. There is no more this idea of a natural correlation between face. So this is, of course, an ideological value, utopic value of the face. Similarly, when we look at the video, the, what occurs in the video, we see that an old man becomes a young woman. So there is the fluidity, nomadicity of identity, which I thank Christina Voto for uh, helping me understand that, uh, for example, Rosie Braidotti was working on this idea already in 2012. So once again, we have deep values of the fact that any face can become any other face. Finally, we see that there is a, no more distinction no more opposition between the virtual and the real, because the real is actually the base on which the virtual is created. And at the same time, the virtual is used so that we can really understand faces. So I will call this a form of phenorealism. Sorry. Uh, secondly, uh, it is interesting to 
understand what are the historical roots of meta -human. So we have a kind of cultural shift about what I will call a digital habit toward faces and a kind of technological shift, which depend on the increasing processing power, highly definition of cameras, 4K, 8K, 16K, and AI. So from the point of view of the cultural habit toward digital, it all started actually in the 90s. So realism cannot be separated from familiarity. And we have been exposed to digital faces on a daily basis in mass culture almost from 30 years now. It all started in the 90s. One of the first movie uh, was Terminator 2, but 1995 Toy Story. This is a cartoon reboot, 1996, and 1997 Final Fantasy VII, uh, which uh, is, uh, from an historical point of view, extremely interesting exactly for the shift to a photo photorealistic CGI. This implies a kind of epistemic degradation, uh, which is extremely interesting because it is not something new. So this is a spot from 1999 made not, uh, uh, not by coincidence, by PlayStation, in which there was this, this girl. And it was one of the first photorealistic CGI uh, of head deformation which was made. And what is extremely interesting is that already in 1999, people could not distinguish if such face was true or not. And they went actually looking for her because they believed that such girl existed and they wanted to met her. However, of course, it was nothing real, but it, it all started to think, we all started to worry a lot about the fact that we could not really recognize a true face from a digital face, a true face from a fake one. And this all started in the late 90s. And this is, it is in this term that I use the concept of epistemic degradation. A consequence of this is a linguistic consequence. There is something extremely interesting in the fact that there has been a cultural shift in the language we use. We do not talk, or at least uh, talk very less, about digital characters or avatars. If you think about it, it was like one of the main words, one of the main keywords, think also of the movie. But we are talking more and more about digital humans. So we are shifting our conception of what those digital beings are, are to us, basically. Uh, even if you see here on the, on the left, the unique, which is, a, which is a software of chatbots, which have a face and they are actually, they have a huge success and they are called digital units. But a cultural shift could not occur without a technical one. And from this point of view, we still, everything still begins in the nineties and then continues in the 2000s, as uh, Simon Arcani teaches us, with the first good algorithm of face detection and face recognition. So basically, in these 30 years, what is extremely interesting is that there has been a project. Here you, you can see the quotation from the director of R&D at Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine is the engine which allows metahumans to work. And it was from 2018. And uh, over the last 10 years, they have worked a lot on facial animation, and their point is that if I can tell whether or not this character is lying, then we have won. So lying become the capacity of understanding lying is the main thing about the face being true. It is the main uh, scientific and technological aim. It is not a philosophical one. Uh, all, it all started probably in 2001 with Final Fantasy Spirit Within, which was a terrible, which had a terrible reception, but was the first movie with fully made actors. It came from video game from Square Enix, the makers of Final Fantasy VII, I was uh, mentioning before. And you also have in 2011, Alien Noir, which was a digital game, which was all about reading digital, uh, reading, uh, digital faces. What occurs now, if you look at uh, the the, the modern contemporary technology is that we have automatized this kind of reading. So we have highly uh, definition cameras, which are coupled with AI algorithms, often made with deep learning, so that the digital faces, we are, you have almost no mediation from the human in recreating the digital faces. The human is doing little work, let's say. And this is a, really something which is revolutionary from a technical point of view, because before making even a single face uh, could imply months and months of work like a painter and of course a very high budget in money but nowadays it is no more like this so here is the question of my talk of today at the light of all this can meta human faces be defined as force or fake 
Are there meaningful difference between Pinocchio's face and the one of digital humans? So we cannot answer this question without choosing a perspective. And we have two main perspectives. The first one is the biological one. I use here the wonderful book from Jacques Monod, Le hasard et la nécessité, he is a Nobel winner, uh, in which uh, biology is understood in terms of what is in random in some part and necessary in the philosophical meaning, of course, in another. On the other hand, we have the, the, the semiotic perspective about the idea that lying and science are uh, very hard to tell from if something is true or something is false. This is an entire project which was created by Umberto Eco. Uh, so from the point of the biological point of view, you can say that metahuman faith, faith for faith to be real, it must have a certain numbers of bones with certain characteristics, certain muscles, certain nerves. Even more importantly, they must be developed in a certain way. We know that the face of humans uh, is developed in the womb of the, of the women we at a certain number of months and around the filtrum, which is this part of our, our face. So when we look at how uh, digital faces are made, which I worked on in the last week, also thanks to Roberto Gamboni, member of faces who helped me. Uh, well, they are of course, nothing like that. You have a geometrical shape, which is a set of mathematical point in space on which you apply a texture, which is an image, basically. And even though such image can have, as you see, the, for example, on the skin on the last right picture, uh, several levels of details, they are called. Well, actually, it's only one level. So one level. So for example, if you work on a wrinkle, uh, you can work on the wrinkle itself. In reality, a surgeon will work on the underlying muscle behind the wrinkle. It will not act on the wrinkle itself. So not on the surface of expression in semiotic terms. This is why a lot of bugs and glitches in the digital games are extremely interesting because they show the fact that such faces are not real, that they belong to another kind of ontology. There are some, somehow empty faces. There is, however, another semiotic, uh, another perspective, which is a semiotic one, and which is related to the fact, I quote you, Massimo Leone, that the conundrum of artificial face is that there are no natural face, yet there is no face that it is also not natural. So the problem with the first perspective, of course, it is bounded to the idea of what is nature of naturality. And semiotics, since Roland Barthes, 1957, mythology, semiotics started by doubting about the idea of the very idea of nature, what was natural. So uh, even more importantly, uh, Massimo Leone explains that artificiality cannot be the property of an object for semiotics. It must be the result of a relational condition and I had of an interaction. Finally, one of the last of the latest and last uh, writings of Peirce before his death, uh, changed his idea of what the habit was by saying that a true will be, which means something which is potential or which is virtual, we will say it's not the same thing, but is as real as an actuality. So I will start from this to offer a definition of what a real face is and should be for semiotics. A real face is any face looking thing which is able to reproduce the full complexity of the experience that we have every day by interacting with the faces of all others in a variety of situations and from a multiplicity of purposes. With the complexity of the experience being directly related to the multiplicity of meanings that a face can be endorsed with. Therefore, a semiotically real face is any meaningful face looking surface of expression which is able to trigger an effect of reality by enacting all the habits that its interpreter has developed toward faces during his life. So from this perspective, uh, if we look at the two pictures on our right, uh, we see a form of composite portrait, which was completely false. It was a, an old technique of, uh, let's say, photo manipulation. While in the bottom, we see a real thermography of a man. However, we have no kind of habits, or at least very few habits, toward the bottom picture. It is almost impossible for us that this say that is intu intuitively a real face, that it is not made on a computer, for example. On the contrary, it is astonishing for us to discover that the pictures uh, on the top is not real, is not a real face. So basically, if a face is capable of giving first impression, 
if there is an emotional agency, for example, that if a face is sad, then we feel sad too. If we can fall in love with the face, if we can intuitively uh, misread the feelings and thoughts of someone, so the prediction, and if their physical features can make us naturally recognize the traces of both subjectivity, the fact that it is a person, intersubjectivity, the relation with this person with other person, then such faces are not realistic in the terms of deception, but they are so because there is something non-artificial in our relation with them. So we will choose the semiotic perspective, but I really want to point out that this is not because I want to deny, uh, like semioticians sometimes do, that nature exists and biology uh, is important. Of course, they exist, of course, they are. But meta human faces, they are cultural artifacts designed for communicative purposes. So, semiotic is a good choice. And more importantly, our objective of research is understanding the relation between the fact that we can read the face as a lying face. Um, and the correlation between the lying face and the real face. So we have to understand what are the interpretative processes guiding our experience. So we have four questions, and in the last 10 minutes, I will try to uh, explain them all about what is this experience of a face. So first of all, we have to understand what is a face looking thing from my definition, uh, which is related to our brain. Secondly, all meta-human meta -human faces are made. So do they present, for a semiotic perspective, the necessary elements for semiosis to occur? Thirdly, what are those phenomenological and sociological habits of the face experience, which makes them real? And finally, what is the impact of the mathematical transduction of metahuman faces in our interpretation of them? Because 3D scanning and all these technology, they are making mathematical transduction of our perceived reality. So from the point of view of a face-looking thing, I will say that a face looking thing is something that our brain intuitively recognizes as a face. And we, this intuition is extremely interesting for a semiotic perspective uh, because it has an, um, a, a very highly rated degree of trustability. We trust our sense, we trust our perception, even if they trick us many times. So, this is from the point of view of the consciousness, of course. As semiotician, we're interested in the fact that if uh, a face meets the basilar cognitive properties to recognize face, then they are uh, at least at the beginning true faces. And from this point of view, of course, meta human faces are true faces because even objects are able to trigger and to convey very complex uh, cognitive, uh, let's say, bias that we have uh, toward not only to recognize a face as a shape but even to give a personality to the object, such as the one you see on my left picture. What is even more interesting is that we have an equivalent of this in purse, in the idea of a belief. For purse, a belief is an habit which may be precognitive, so may be, relation, may be related to cognition, which we do not know that we have. So uh, this is exactly how false positive of pareidolia works. We discover that we are made, genetic, genetically made to discover faces when we encounter the false positive of pareidolia. Before such things, we do not even know that we know what is a face. So this is perfectly a Persian belief. Finally, uh, from the cognitive point of view, another important thing is that the face must be able to trigger our mirror neurons. So some kind of empathic, let's say, uh, mechanism for which we tend to simulate the face of other and simulate the feelings of other through this kind of simulation. This was discovered in 2008 already by Professor Jacoboni. And although the, the question of empathy is extremely complex and cannot be reduced to a mere neurological process, Actually, when we look at this experiment, they were made with very simple pictures. And once again, we have no reason to doubt, at least theoretically, that metahuman faces can produce such kind of effects. So now that we have understood the cognitive bases are all met, we have to ask if the semiosis bases of meaning are met. And yes, they are. Uh, I have spent, as I was telling you the last weeks, understanding how metahuman faces are made. And for a semiotician, which is extremely interesting, is to see that from their design, the very beginning of the design, they are made a system of differences. So what you see on your, uh, on your right is called the face topology. It is the way in which you have different structures of uh, geometrical structure, let's say, that will shape the face 
and that will identify different areas of the face. And on your left, you see how the system of expression of metahumans can be coded through a system of differences. It is almost like the traits that we know in uh, linguistics, of course. Uh, not only that, but we also know that there are two values actually of relation, not only in a positive one, but also one of participation as Claudio Paolucci teaches us. And from this point of view also, we see that uh, metahuman faces are deeply related to intersubjectivity for the very simple fact that, uh, as Umberto Eco was saying, they are made by what was made before them by all the traces of other human being. So they only live as a collection of other signs, which makes a new science. This was also interesting because uh, in, his, in her book, Lily Morrison of 2009 was inquiring the first technique of face recognition. And it, it was also exactly the point that we understand what the face is only through the difference and its relation with other faces. So semiotic basis, also are met for metahuman faces to be recognized as real faces. So then we have the what I call the phenomenological and sociological aspects. So what is interesting here, what you see on your left is a picture of the most realistic CGI in digital games in the 90s, while on your left, on your right, sorry, you have the 2021 face of metahumans. What you see here is a leap in the quantity of information, which become a qualitative leap in the aspects of a fair experience. So we can recognize more things which are literal, which makes literally a face. The more the details, the more the data, which from a semiotic perspective are nothing more than information, uh, actually they make the they make the phenomenological experience of a face. Not only that, but there is a direct direct uh, re relation between the quantity of information and the sociological aspect aspects of the face. Uh, indeed, the fact that the face can be imbued, attributed meaning, social meaning, that the face can be deemed as worthy or not worthy, trusty or not trusty, and so on. The fact that they have, we have some idea of beautiful faces and not beautiful faces. All these things depend at the, at the very core on the quantity of information. So this is, was really the point of the high defin definition of new cameras, allowing for such kind of information, which in semiotics terms allow for semantic ambiguity. We can give a lot of meaning, and we are not sure of these meanings, even though they can be, uh, and, and they are, socially created. Finally, the last point is about the fact that for a face to be true, uh, we do not have any access to the mathematics of the world. We do not have any kind of neutral access. This is what the cognitive studies have proven us. There is nothing such as neutral perception of the world, a lot of experiment and so on. And the face, of course, is no exception. Indeed, still in the first technique in the 90s, the first and the better techniques of the face recognition, uh, it was directly proposed that face recognition in humans works like a form of deduction like a form of guessing. So a real face must be guessed, guessed more than it is perceived. We know this very well by the simple fact of how many times we look different in, our, in, in different pictures. Um, this is because, of course, what is the real picture of our face? Is any of these pictures false, any of these pictures true? It is a mere, mere question of our perception of our face, of our habits of our seeing us every day changes our idea of our own face. And on this point, I worked with a dear friend of mine, which is a surgeon, an aesthetic surgeon on the face. And she told me a lot of interesting things about this point. So one of the main issues that she has when working is that first of all, before the surgery, people, they don't know, they don't really know their face. They have seen it all their lives. So they think that they know it, but actually, for example, they think that they are symmetrical. While actually human faces are not symmetrical at all. Secondly, after the surgery, uh, sometimes patients may say, well, but my, my face was different uh, before. And then she, she shows the picture and actually the face was exactly the same, of course. Uh, but by looking every day in a different way at, at our faces, we began to change our perception of how we perceive ourselves. Finally, there have been a lot of legal issues about the unreliability of computer generated projection, you know, like before, after, because people was looking at the computer and the mathematical version of their faces, and they were hoping to look like this. 
but not only the face is organic and may react not always as wanted, but also the kind of representation, mathematical representation of a face has nothing to do with our real life representation uh, of a face. This is why in some sense, the GAN uh, uh, produced face are easy to trick us because they are not faces at all. They are still non-moving images of our face. While the face, and it is one of the main issues for space recognition software, is something which escapes singular recognition, which is changing, which is uh, existing in a lot of different contexts. However, meta-human faces, since they are made uh, since they are made to be used in 3D words, and there are a lot of contexts. You can be closer to a face, you can see it from different perspective under different lightings, uh, when it's raining, when it's wet, when it's not wet, and so on. So uh, we can say that uh, liability becomes a truth criteria for the face, but not because we are actually able to read the face but because we are easily mistaken the readings of our face. This is also what psychological experiments are proving about our capacity of detecting lies, for example, in children and in many other occasions. The point is not that a true face must be read. It is that we can mistakenly read a face. So we must have some elements. So to conclude, we see that we have four semiotic components of the face experience. Indexicality, related to the cognitive trust and semiotic belief, relationality, the structural difference and the encyclopedic participation, informativity, which makes what I call the phenorealism and the social realism, and finally, the interpretability about the fact that the face is deformed, is mediated, and we, is something that lies to us a lot of time, even if we don't want to, even, even if we don't think to. However, so uh, sorry, for this, from this point of view, meta-human faces are completely real. We have actually almost no way of saying that they are false face. The difference um, comes when we go from the level of the expression of the utterance from the level of enunciation. Here we understand that the true difference between, from a semiotic perspective, between uh, a real human face and a digital face because it comes from the difference between the virtuality, the potentiality, and the actuality. So basically, the point is that um, meta-human face, since they are mathematical, they can have any kind of possibility. So they can endorse the value, the utopy that we have seen in the video. However, true faces, our, may, our faces which are made of lace, they cannot mean anything. They cannot do anything. We cannot, for example, have a smile if we are really sad. This is something which is not possible. However, for a meta-human face, it is completely possible. So for meta-human faces, there is no difference between the virtuality, which could be abstractly possible, and the potentiality, what is concretely possible. However, for meta-human faces, uh, such difference, uh, for human faces, such difference is fundamental in defining the identity of our face. So um, this is the thanksography for all the people who have me uh, with, uh, with this, Roberto Gamboni, Cristina Voto, Marco Viola, and Simona Ciantorbi. And this is the bibliography, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Julien. That was fantastic. It's sort of a synthesis of so many uh, streams of research. And I, I also like your neologism of uh, thanks, 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 thanksography, graxiographia. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a nice alternative to acknowledgement. So uh, the, the floor is open for comments. It was a very rich presentation, uh, and um, it has touched um, upon the interest of many of um, uh, the researchers in, in facets. Um, so um, the floor is, is all yours. Um, very uh, naively, uh, I've always thought that uh, something is wrong with the teeth of, uh, of the meta-human creations. Uh, I mean, my, in my impression, that is, the, that is my focus of um, Uncanny Valley. But my wonder is whether uh, that might be, I also talked about it in a little talk that they gave, I can't remember where, Bucharest maybe. Um, in a way, there must be um, a limit to the trompe l'oeil if the trompe l'oeil is presented as um, virtuoso 
uh, performance of the painter. So the painter doesn't actually aim at deceive um, uh, the spectator once and for all, but it, 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 um, he or she um, uh, seeks to control the aspectuality of deceiving. So in a way, you must be deceived, but you must be undeceived in order to somehow acknowledge the mastery of, of the painter. Something similar, I think, happens also with metahumans. So I, I wonder whether you have reflected on the aspectuality of this uh, photorealism effect, which seems to me very important also in the marketing strategy of, uh, of metahumans. Uh, yes, thanks a lot for the question. So first of all, yes, as you have maybe seen from the glitch that I showed, the teeth and the hairs were the only as and the eyes were aspects of the face which was absent because they are absent from the texture. So they are differently it's scanned, and so it is of course another uh, one of the weak point of the metahuman faces. But I would say that is only a matter of time because there are no really technological limits to the kind of 3D scanning of teeth, for example. And, um, but for, yeah, for example, in the case of air, for example, one of the most difficult things to make are the air, which is strange, but actually there is an algorithm which is replicating the irregularity of air because we, uh, we, we have seen that in the beginning, uh, we made things too uh, like symmetrical or like logical and so on. While nowadays we understand that it is extremely complex the way in which the air, air are represented. But I will say that my point of today was exactly that the metahuman project is not about a mastery, is not about astonishing us for the realism, is about automatizing the realism, which is something which is quite interesting because it changes the aspectuality. It, the only thing they really care, even for commercial purposes, is to replicate the experience that we have of the face. It is not to hide the fact that the face is the digital one, that is not a real human, that it looks, really looks like a human. These are not, these are artistic values, which are of course part of the project, but they are, I would say, uh, used instrumentally, only for example, in the case of Unique, so that the chatbot, when you think with the chatbot, then it will uh, uh, express, for example, sadness for your problem, uh, so that you feel okay with that. But this is the only point. It is not the fact that it must be, uh, a real sadness, if you understand what I mean. So I think that this is extremely important to understand the context, the, the commercial context in which metahuman faces exist, which is mainly a context of automatizing and producing, mass producing photorealistic faces, which is extremely different from the original context of the 90s to 2000s, which was an artistic, artistic project of creating realistic faces. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any other comments or questions or objections, insights? I there see Bruno a by the Bruno in yes. the chat saying that, yeah, there is this the new version of GAN, it's GAN 2, that is uh, extremely apt at um, producing uh, photorealistic hair. Uh, I don't know if you have come across the, um, the videos that have been circulating for the promotion. It is really impressive. But at the same time, the, the videos are mostly about painted hair and not about the real hair, which is a real, yeah. <laughs> let's say. The problem yeah. in movies and in digital worlds is that you have to think of a lot of things. For example, the reflection of light on the air, the effect of winds the different condition, all these things are part of movies and of digital games, but are not part of pictures because there is not a, a system of physics which must be simulated. So it changes everything. Yeah, it's, um, it's the multiplicity, you know, the multiplicity of hair that as a, as a, as a, um, <coughs> a gestalt, which is uh, very difficult to capture, I believe, and to reproduce. Um, um, in, in the case of, uh, and, and this is why I was uh, a little bit puzzled when uh, I remember Marco, Dr. Viola, we, we, we um, discussed on the fact that there were these simulations, face simulations without hair. Um, when we were, we received the visit of our colleague from, um, um, yeah, 
so 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 i mean it, it's it's even in the study of facial emotions you know sometimes you have this kind of puppet uh, faces you know with no hair but the hair is part of the face you know even if even even, even if it's absent it's part of the face so um okay ah maybe there is another comment in the chat that i haven't seen uh yeah bruno says pixar usually doesn't want to be photorealistic but the attention on the hair is that as its maximum this is interesting. It's a kind of another dominion of realism. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, what, what Professor Suresh says is worthy of further consideration. It's as if, you know, somehow we are witnessing an expansion of the focus toward the periphery of the face after modeling the eyes, the mouth, and the uh, now we are focusing on the internal the teeth but also on what is so like little by little of course this is going to expand to the relation between the face and the head the head and the body and so on and so forth um which is um uh, of course something that we're going to follow very closely uh, hoping that uh, uh, one day we'll have a photorealistic professor leone like giving a lecture why professor leone is somewhere else on a beach so um we'll continue now with the next uh, and uh, i i believe last lecture because uh, i know if uh, uh, christina professor what do you confirm that uh, um we are not gonna be able to hear um uh the um uh talk by sophie dufay from university of leuven I, I think that she wasn't, uh, she was here yesterday, but then she disappeared. But anyway, um, uh, we'll, we'll gladly, gladly give the floor to um, Professor Barbotto. Uh, Professor Barbotto is also a postdoc at the University of Turin, and uh, she's also a professor at the University of Merida in Me Mexico. And uh, um, she focuses on relations between uh, face studies and the arts. She's also an accomplished artist uh, with a wonderful little gallery in Turin that I'm eager to visit when I'm next to be back. Uh, but today she's going to propose a, a talk entitled Untruth uh, and Truth at the same time, <laughs> Faces Written with Light. So Professor Barbotto, the, the, last, uh, the last word on the, on the workshop is yours. Last but not least. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Massimo Leone. Thank you to all our colleagues and to um, CI for uh, hosting us uh, today in this um, seminar that is uh, going to um, close with this presentation. And I'm trying to. OK. Yes. Are you seeing the, the screen? OK, so let's start. I will uh, read my presentation and uh, um, uh, comment uh, starting with the, with the title. Let's go in on. Sorry, but I was surprised about uh, the absence of uh, the other colleagues. So I was uh, almost ready and I'm ready. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, read this presentation and uh, hopefully have uh, some minutes later for uh, comments, questions, and uh, sharing together. So the textual apparatus uh, related to truth, to truth, is an elaborated genesis whose process necessarily implies the bringing into play of its counterpart, the non-truth, and especially what comes between them. This instancy following the semiotic square of gray mass stands in a relation of contradiction with the former, which in turn see in the lie, in the lies, the elements with which to establish a relation of contrariety. Not lies and not true, on the other hand, constitute the complementary modalizing function, a non lie therefore would imply the true. Behind the dichotomies, our interest resides in vector trends dynamic interstice between these four apparently fixed points, a bit too topic, in sense of Maren, 
I'm quoting, le discours utopique occupe la place vide de la résolution historique d'une contradiction. Il est le degré zéro de la synthèse dialectique des contraires. Il est l'expression discursive du neutre. This position is emphasized by the title in which the untrue lexem is crossed by the graphic sign whose syntax erases but still less the word itself shine through, enhancing its value. So the untrue also, on the one hand, it would lead to falsehood. Uh, on the other hand, it would allude the thoughts of philosophical turn to the truth, the negation of the false. It is here underlined the ambiguity of the term and the opening to a multidimensional semiotic world. Among the first chapter of L'Acte Photographique de Philippe de Bois, titled La Photographie comme Miroir du Réel, an affirmation present above all at the debut of photography, which over time has become laden with the contradiction and adversities reflection he writes. La Photographie, I'm quoting, est massivement considéré comme une imitation un peu plus parfaite de la réalité. Et elle tient cette capacité mimétique selon le discours de l'époque, de sa nature technique même, de son procès mécanique qui permet de faire apparaître une image de manière automatique, objective, presque naturelle. Indeed, for a long time, the act of photography was charged with the presumed natural, spontaneous, documentaristic character, mainly due to the process by which the photos come to light. Direct contact with light on the foil at the first and then on the film. Its veracity arouses the interest of art, initially excluding any kind of overlap of competition with drawing and painting, which, however realistic they might have been, would never have reached the levels of photograph. Even among Pierce's writing, the naturalness with which photography transposes reality to film shines, especially, he said, I'm quoting, instantaneous photographs are very instructive because we know that they are in certain respects exactly like the objects they represent. But this resemblance is due to the photographs having been produced under such circumstances that they were physically forced to correspond point by point to nature. In that aspect, then, they belong to the second class of sign, those by physical connection, closing quote. Indeed, for years, it was thought that this relationship was direct and that the photography device enjoyed an a prioristic immediacy capable of capturing and transmitting reality and truth in its entirety through the light. The chemical and the alchemical effect caused by the contact of light will, uh, with the photosensitive base continues to be a fascinating feature of photography and its derivation. But we soon realized that another type of luminous space would be discussed. That of the pixel as the smallest element characterized by color and intensity, which uh, taken together would give expression to digital images. And uh, while the hard mechanism of the virtual computational digital apparatus were being developed, at the same time, the analogy of light was being integrated and penetrated by um, computer programming and AI. Well, for some photographers, such as Cartier-Bresson, the moment um, of uh, photography is the artistic click. For others, such as Graciela Turbide, who has just has been uh, interviewed for facets, there are actually two silent moments, the click and the revelation. The semiotic gap between the shooting and the revelation and later dissemination phase come up intensively and with the same straight soon, it seems to melt again, mainly due to the major technological changes. By the dematerialization of the objects as physical presence and the binarization of the medium apparatus, not only the time between the shot and the revelation has been lost, but also the space between the attentional location and the revelation that becomes more immediate. This gap is reduced and gives rise to the emblematic immediacy 
of our time. The movement is reduced to the point of being cancelled. The centripetal force that for, from the snapshot allowed to serve to be reached is minimized as a center of semantic condensation, which, after having been outside, rejoined by finding itself again. It was a movement of continuous coming and going, now dissolved, liquid, expanding, and perhaps lost. The most understandable discrepancy does denoting a clear manipulation of the image and thus an of, uh, of obvious alteration of the initial physical of con condition of contact were based on methods of refined post edition. There are many examples of how archive in history have been structured as the deviation from the truth in many ways, one of which is extremely evident, thus or the exclusion of visual data. As we see a famous example here of Joseph Stalin in a photo edited in 1937. Manipulation, according to John von Kuberta, is intrinsic to photography and not necessarily read as pejorative. In his book, The Judas Kiss, there is an entire chapter entitled Manipulation as Style, where he says, I'm quoting, specialist critics have often contrasted the category of straight photography versus manipulative photography. In reality, they refer, refer to operational programs that give a practical answer to the two doctrine of the old historical dispute purim, purism versus pictorialism. The combination of multiple choice in the construction of the images, such as the choice of the subject, the color scale, the frame, the perspective, the coordination between time sensitivity, diaphragm, the development process, etc., would represent a small quoting those of manipulation in terms of the author. Framing is manipulation, focusing is manipulation, selecting the moment of shooting is manipulation. The sum of all these steps is concretized in a resulting imaging and unmitigated manipulation. So the manipulation photograph, the manipulated photograph is considered a tautology and finally take part as a, an inevitable portion of the creation and perception intrinsic to, the, to its act of writing, the result of its process at the root of the device, sensors, uh, sensors and other indicators involved. We have seen, therefore, that although the photograph initially conceived is indical, it never corresponds exactly to reality because this is ineffable in its totality. Also, attempts at discretization are becoming more and more sophisticated. Photography seems to respond to other truths. It highlights the semantic deviation between being and representing, between the momentum and the simulacrum. If we think of self-portrait, we often do not completely reorganize ourselves when we see the uh, recognize, sorry, ourselves when we see the image that represent us. As in the example of Schomburg, who sent a portrait to himself to his uh, painter friends, uh, um, Oscar Kokoschka, and wrote to him, quoting, I'm sending you a photograph of myself, even though I cannot recognize the quality you so kindly attribute to me. So those, the, the fourth obvious deviation between reality and its recognition through the realistic photography. With the emergence of photography, it was mainly good documentary, uh, filmmakers, reporters, ethnographers, and anthropologists who were responsible for transmitting reality. The documentary dimension, among many others, is dealt by Dondero and Basso in semiotic of photography. Photography, quoting, is the documentary fruition practice. Also, Okui and Zower uh, talks about the photography as document in its um, text photography between history and uh, monuments. Photography, I am quoting from her book, uh, and film are often archival records, documents, and pictorial testimonies of the existence of recorded fact, an excess of the scene. 
bringing it to a furbished pace of pictorial generation and accumulation. In this productive and receptive bulimia, an interesting point emerged is what remains outside Olvido in history is the known text untrue or missing and silence, of course, also speak. And this is a question to develop. Is the statue of true call into question if there is no textual evidence? Effectively, without the photographic and filmic, for example, record of events or performances, the condition of reality or we said, on which they uh, received effect as work of art depended would not have existed. So what uh, then happens to what is left out? The device and machine used in addition to the eye of photographer also construct filters to reality and vice versa. Censura regime can be an emblematic example. Among the first innovators of film, flattery within the first photograph realized a film that was not inert, but was responsible for the quality mode and the regime of truth of image capture. He was one of the first to replace orthochromatic film with panchromatic film, which was more sensitive to colors and capable of conveying readers verisimilitude. Think especially of the dark skin of the Polynesian population with whom he was working. Also during our seminar, La Cultura del Rostro Latinoamericano, Maria so Luisa Solis with her speech, Stereotipos Raciales y Clasismos en las Redes Sociales en México Contemporáneo, explain how the use of the different pantone in digital film create eventually just a partial history that can foment racism based on criteria of exclusion. Conclusion. This transition highlight how the type of medium conditions photographic success, but it also shows how there can be intrinsic racism when choices are made, starting from the same material used of typological exclusion or inclusion. So already with film, ontological contact did not guarantee that photography would become the voice of ontological truth. Presence itself is somehow illusionary. Bill Gengam, in her... Um... Okay. Uh, in her article entitled The Truth of Deep Fake, underline the ambiguity of the frontier between truth and fiction, above all in relation to AI. She also speaks about Eugenia vis Visual, uh, quoting, um, she said, vision follows patterns, and in the future, we will therefore only have the perception of what falls under those patterns and what lies outside Closing quote. So the notion of untrue is as exclusion of a part is thus reiterated. Could AI deepfake be revealing a visual, visual culture of Eugenia of vision that is uh, that only what is uh, in the indicated pattern enters in our visibility? It is an algorithmic racism, Eugenia, that comes of the look much more powerful than, than the form of discrimination we already know. Algorithmic racism is a central theme of our age based on the inability to see other phenomena because the patron will be uh, incorporated into our vision by now. The experiment of Bernardo Fontes of uh, Rio de Janeiro, you see in the, right, the photo, big one, seems to underline this aspect. He downloaded 4,100 images from the generative adversarial network called this person does not exist and superimposed them. Then he separated the result in three examples. One of 100 images, one of 500 and the third of 1,000 images. He was surprised that one, two, and third group were almost the same, with an evident tendency to the homologation. 
from a facial image, the generator learns the distribution of the elements of a face and implies its feature to a new image. Deepfake, followed with, with Belgeman, um, uh, is an image produced by an algorithm processed through human mediation, which uses thousands of imaging stores in database to learn a person's facial movement, including leak movement and voice modulation, and predict how they may say, say something uh, I didn't say. So starting from a real imaging, these deepfakes are instead elaboration generated by programming algorithm of artificial neural network. A computational architecture that has by uh, analogy the functioning of the brain and interconnects pattern hidden in the data. Uh, she also gave a plastic explication about the gun, comparing with the dribbling. This is interesting because uh, which come um, dribbling comes from uh, the language of football and indicates a maneuver of the athlete aimed at deceiving the opponent by discarding him. Um, so it can follow in an in infinite, infinite way, discarding and discarding and getting better and better. And this network architecture, um, uh, Belgeman said, presenting in 2014, um, marked a revolution in the field of images. In this architecture, two networks are pitted against each other, acting respectively as generator as, and the discriminators. It is up to the first to generate images and the second to decide whether that image is real or false. The more discriminator learns to recognize the false images, the more the generators learn to deceive it. Uh, closing quote. Exclusion from the main discourse as a form of untrue reflects an old topic. Only mention here that a representative um, that uh, representativeness as the interaction of different levels of power, agentiveness, and the visibility. A quick open frame and uh, um, um, is not uh, working. One more slide appearing. Okay, I was just uh, uh, introducing a quick opening frame as example of the root of which the normalization of a system, the virtual one, that is even absent or inexistent in some places. It was, uh, um, sorry, ECR is the resetting digital rights. Uh, and it just to say, for example, that on March 2019, Africa had a combined internet penetration of rate only of 39% amounting uh, to half of them in Facebook. So according to official report on Tableau uh, and with the parentheses uh, COVID situation, um, that has accelerated dynamics that were previously present, problematizing the structure of digital law often questioning. It. Quoting from the um, uh, from the, this um, state of uh, situation, uh, one of the key challenges to digital rights uh, especially privacy and personal data protection has been the tracking and monitoring of people, movement, communication, and health data by governments, aid, but private companies and the humanitarian bodies. So in some countries, the right to privacy and speech have collided with authoritarian governmental action and monopolies of power, leading to imprisonment for disinformation and fake news, where the statue of the fake is not assumed as a negotiable process, but instead is dictated a priori. For example, quoting from the um, tableau, such as Eto Ethiopia carry a broad definition of misinformation get, that gives authority discretionary power to declare any piece of information false. Or these new laws against fake news are often characterized by broadness and vagueness in their definition and application. Further, they prescribe punitive sanctions such as prison sentencing up to six months in South Africa, five years in Botswana and Algeria, 20 years in Zimbabwe. 
So authoritarian power, surveillance and racism are the main issue present in art practice as it has been shown in the exposition Watches Surveillance Art and Photography, established in Gothenburg in 2016. Many examples of contemporary treatment of the face in artistic and photographic terms can be found here. But we need to open up the perspective with the um, with the regard to what now falls within the broad scope of the photographic statute by introducing two categories about meta photography, the first one. Let's see an example. These images under portrait evade any of true claims that are associated with the practice of moonshot portrait from which it Thomas Raff borrows. His work seems to state just because something is seen, it doesn't not mean it is true. Uh, I'm quoting uh, Lee Moritz. In fact, his work go further. The more you see, the, the less the truth can be revealed. The underportrait experiment with the true claims of the photographic document and visualize the dissonance between the natural continuity and the underlying process of identity construction through visual representation, including the category of doubtfulness as the cross space of suspended judgment. And the other category is that of post photography refers to the photography that flows in the hybrid space of digital society and that is a consequence of uh, visual superabundance in terms of von Kuperta that you say in the screen, in the fury of images. We are, he said, immersed in a new and different visual order, which appears marked above all by three factors, the immateriality and the transmissibility of images, their multiplication and uh, availability, and their decisive contribution in making knowledge and communication encyclopedia. So post photography, as we have already seen, includes surveillance camera and facial recognition system, satellite device and other automated photo capture tools. In relation to the category of true, post photography has given a shock whose provocation would start not so much from the nature of the technological tools used, which is in a case are based on similar property of light and optics, nor on the same possibility of lying or not, but rather on the transmissibility and diffusion on the magnification and the degeneration of data on the exclusion and inclusion of visual and informative materials on ambiguity and incapacity of discern, on authorial and informative practice, on possible cluster and the influence of imaging society, on the role on their informative co-participation of social meaning. I'm going to uh, closing the presentation. And um, other instances are also different in uh, terms of post photography. For example, memory is opposed to communication. Representation is opposed to connectivity. And with respect to time, in terms of von Kuberta, the decisive moments are concerned by the ordinary ones. Um, so post photography can easily be insert as diffuse uh, possibility of aspectualization of untrue, possibly as part of fake images and deep fake data that remains on uh, an ongoing drawn back which need analyze and proactive solution. Post photography can easily be insert as a diffuse possibility of um, um, okay, so the tendency to accumulate and collect uh, results in contemporary times in a widespread visual uh, bulimia, as we said, in which the disorder between reception and expulsion sometimes causes confusion and possible disturbance. Photographs and images, food enjoyed with all the senses, incorporate new data sets, which in turn constitute infinite quantity of possible connection that it is up to us, the cipher, use or contemplate in the best possible way. Uh, thank you. I'm closing uh, the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Baboto, for this <clears throat> extremely rich uh, uh, presentation that has touched on um, many topics uh, 
related to the area of your investigations and <clears throat> also for the effort to articulate the field of uh, um, uh, uh, post photography. I uh, <clears throat> read a message for, for, from the president uh, of uh, CYAS, uh, uh, Professor Flora Coquillo. Congratulations for the enjoyable and inspiring talks. Thank you very much for the great workshop and look forward to meeting you all in, in person. Uh, well, <clears throat> it was a pleasure, Professor Coquillo. And um, um, of course, <clears throat> we have a little bit of time for questions or comments on this last presentation. Uh, uh, that was um, the final firework uh, for this symposium, this workshop um, uh, that has lasted uh, two days, two half days. Uh, we are perfectly on time. Um, uh, you, you must be all a little bit tired after a long morning, especially Professor Soro, who has started at seven uh, with me in Shanghai. Uh, <clears throat> but um, of course, this is not the final word on our research on. Uh, on the face, I think it's very important for us to organize these workshops uh, regularly, uh, I would say like once or twice a year in order to set uh, some milestone and, and then uh, continue with our research. And uh, as, a, as a PI of uh, facets, I, I really see that uh, the individual investigations are taking shape, are developing, they're growing and they're developing also a, an individual physiognomy. So. The faces of your research are also taking shape, and uh, it's really a pleasure and a privilege to be to be witnessing that. Um, well, uh, we must also thank our our uh, host institution, and uh, I, I thank once again uh, Dr. Rondina for providing us with technical uh, assistance during these two half days. Um, I guess that. Uh, 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 yeah, there are many messages of thanks in the chat uh, from all the members of FACETS. This um, uh, workshop has been recorded, so um, then Dr. Rodina will tell us uh, the link uh, where we'll be able to retrieve in a while the, the recording and is going to be available on the site of uh, CYAS and also on the website of, uh, of FACETS. So, uh, I think the time is uh, uh, ripe for wrapping up our workshop. It has been a pleasure seeing you all, albeit only online. Uh, I'll be back in October in Paris. Uh, well, I'll certainly see you, many of you in Turin before that, but in, in Paris, I'll, I'll be back in October as um, Directeur d'Etudes Associés uh, of the Foundation Maison des Sciences de l'Homme, and maybe there's gonna be an opportunity to organize uh, a little workshop there in, in presence, uh, let's let's pray that the present conditions continue to to improve. For the time being, I really thank you very much. Uh, I, I really appreciate all your efforts, uh, the talks, the world wonderful top level, and um, we'll uh, try now to turn them into nice papers, nice chapters, nice articles of our individual or collective publication projects. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, see you very soon in Turin, I guess. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bene, grazie mille. Grazie ancora. <laughs> Ci vediamo più tardi. Viene il professor Leone. Passa nel pomeriggio come la sua giornata. Allora, io pensavo di passare domani. Domani perché oggi ho una riunione alle 5. Quindi non sì. so se ce la faccio. Eh, lei preferisce che io passi mh, questo pomeriggio? Forse sì. Ma può venire anche domani. Eventualmente se io non sarò qui ci sarà la mia collega. Sì. Quindi, no. Ah, ecco, va bene, va bene. Allora, eh, dunque sì, perché dunque, ho una riunione alle 5, eh, potrei sì, farci sì, sì. in realtà. Lei, lei si trattiene fino a che ora più o meno? Credo di rimanere fino alle 5 e mezza oggi. Ah, va bene, ora potrei farcela. Sì, se ce la faccio l'avviso e la, così la saluto anche personalmente, e sì. altrimenti poi riporterò la chiave eh, domani mattina. Sì, domani va mattina. bene, allora. E comunque in ogni modo non ci sono altre cose che io debba fare prima della mia partenza, no? a parte restituire la chiave, 
il final ah, report, mm? un final report da completare. Ecco, sì. Sì, sì, io gli avevo sì, mandato dunque i, i due documenti che mi aveva inviato, non so se sì, li aveva allora, ricevuto. Uno era un, ho ricevuto uno all'intervista e l'altro sì. è un scenario che è per sì, sì, sì. Interno, semplicemente serve a noi per capire come sta. Ecco, invece per, per il final report c'è un format, c'è una... No, non abbiamo un template, può scrivere ah. liberamente. Va bene, va bene, d'accordo, io lo mando prima della fine del mese comunque, negli ultimi va giorni. Va bene. D'accordo. Perfetto. Benissimo, grazie ancora, forse ci vediamo oggi pomeriggio. Vedo un Va po bene, buon pranzo. Grazie, 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 grazie anche a lei, arrivederci, grazie ancora. Eh. Salve, salve. E poi vi informerò non appena sarà pronto su CYS YouTube. Ah sì, 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 benissimo, benissimo. Sì, sì, sì. Del workshop. Ci farà molto Va piacere, bene. benissimo. Grazie, arrivederci. Prego, arrivederci.